thank you for waiting a couple of minutes. Uh, we're so glad you're here. Welcome to day one of our second ever virtual NIH uh, Pathways to Prevention workshop titled Improving Rural Health Through Telehealth Guided Provider to Provider Communication. Uh, we are very excited to get started today after a good amount of planning. So my name is Kate Winsack. I'm the P2P coordinator for this workshop. I will serve as the master of ceremonies to help guide us through today's agenda, the presentations and discussion, and the next two days of the workshop. Um, so first, I want to take this opportunity to say thank you in advance to our workshop co-sponsors and the scientific planning team at uh, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences at NIH, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute at NIH, um, the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy at HRSA, and the Office of the Associate Director for Policy and Strategy at CDC. And then also I would like to thank the independent panel, the workshop speakers, and each of you for participating today. Uh, so I'd like to first cover some housekeeping slides, just briefly, so that everybody who is attending knows how to ask questions throughout the day today. Um, okay, so first you're able to access the workshop agenda, speaker bios, and other workshop resources at this link, uh, if you are interested. Okay, so how to comment and ask questions today. So this is important since we're doing this all virtually. There is a WebEx Q&A pod at the bottom right of your screen uh, that you need to open, and you can submit questions to all panelists uh, via that pod. You can also email us at nhp2p at mail.nih.gov, and feel free to join the conversation on Twitter as well. So if you're having technical difficulties, use the WebEx chat pod. Uh, so that's a good um, distinction to make for uh, the next three days of the workshop. So the chat pod is for any technical difficulties, and then the Q&A pod is for any um, questions for any of the speakers. So for closed captions, you can view the closed captions for this workshop in the multimedia viewer at the bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx window. And again, you need to click on that viewer to open it, just like with the Q&A chat pod. Uh, you can also zoom in on content on WebEx to make the content feel larger or smaller on your screen. Use the magnifying glasses found on the left-hand side of your WebEx window. You kind of have to move your cursor over to the left and, and hover over it to have that window pop up. Um, so opportunities for comment. So you can review and comment on the draft systematic evidence review that was prepared by the Pacific Northwest Evidence-Based Practice Center. Uh, that can also be found on the uh, Office of Disease Prevention website. And then you can review and comment on the panels. Well, let me first um, go back to the first bullet. That draft of the evidence review is open for public comment as of this morning. So everyone feel free to go up and provide comment there um, at any time. You can also review and comment on the panel's draft report, the panel that is overseeing the workshop uh, for the next three days, who you'll be introduced to in a moment. <clears throat> the panel report. <clears throat> summarizes the workshop and provides recommendations for future research priorities, and that will be available roughly um, uh, February of 2021 on the ODP website. Okay, and then lastly, please complete the, complete the post-workshop survey. We'll remind you of this as we get closer to the end of the workshop, um, but at the end of the three-day workshop, all registered attendees will receive an email from NIHP2B Logistics at west.com. The survey is very brief, and we would really appreciate your input. Um, and then join us for day two. So this is a three-day workshop. We'll start day two at the same time tomorrow, and we will cover the following questions, key questions two and three. Uh, what is the effectiveness of provider to provider telehealth for rural patients, and what strategies are effective? What are the barriers and facilitators to implementing sustaining provider to provider telehealth in rural areas? You need to register for each day of the workshop. So if you haven't already, please go to the prevention.nh.gov website to register. And the same is day, true for day three, um, which we will for uh, which we will be covering the final key question, which is, meth is about methodological weaknesses of um, studies of provider to telehealth for rural patients and improvements in study design. So that will be day three. And again, you need to register for each day. Okay, so that's it for my housekeeping slides. Um, so with that, let us begin the workshop. I would like to introduce Dr. David Murray, the Associate Director for Prevention and Director of the Office of Disease Prevention, to kick off our workshop with a welcome and introduction of our first speaker, Dr. Joni Rutter. Go ahead, David. 
Uh, thank you, Kate. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's P2P workshop on improving rural health through telehealth guided provider to provider uh, communication. Next slide, please. Uh, the Office of Disease Prevention uh, is the lead office at NIH uh, responsible for promoting uh, prevention research across all of the institutes and centers that make up NIH. Our mission is to improve the uh, public health by increasing the scope, quality, dissemination, and impact of prevention research uh, supported by NIH. Uh, and we do that through collaboration uh, with our partners uh, at the NIH institutes and, and centers. Uh, next slide, please. If you're not familiar with the Office of Disease Prevention, I would encourage you to take a look at our strategic plan for 2019 through 23. And there's a link here where you can find that strategic plan. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. We have six strategic priorities and they're listed here. Um, we also have three cross-cutting themes that are shown in the center of the slide. We're gonna to focus today on what we inside ODP refer to as strategic priority two, identifying research gaps. That's really our focus today. Um, and I will have a little bit more to say about that later. Uh, but next, uh, I want to introduce Dr. Joni Rutter, uh, who's our next presenter. She is the acting director of the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. Dr. Rutter oversees the planning and execution of the center's complex multifaceted programs that aim to overcome scientific and operational barriers, impeding the development and delivery of new treatments and other health solutions. Under her direction, NCATS uh, uh, is the acronym that we use. NCATS supports innovative tools and strategies to make each step in the translational process more effective and efficient, thus speeding research across a range of diseases. By advancing the science of translation, NCATS help turns promising research discoveries into real world applications that improve people's health. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rutter. Thank you, Dr. Murray. It's great to be here and good morning, everyone. As David said, my name is Joni Rutter and I'm the acting director of the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, or as we call it, NCATS. And it's an honor to kick off this meeting on NIH Pathways to Prevention, this workshop improving rural health through telehealth guided provider to provider communication. I want to thank you all for participating in this conversation and the workshop. I'd also like to, to uh, thank so many of you who've made this virtual workshop possible. Um, it takes a lot to pull something like this off, and I, I can't thank um, everyone individually, but I collectively, I certainly want to thank the NIH organizers and the co-sponsors listed on this screen. And I'd especially like to thank the IT folks who've been working tirelessly this morning to make sure people can work through the technical issues. Um, so thank you for that. I'd also particularly like to thank Shinji Zhang from NHLBI, Adi Atenzia from NCATS, and Kate Winsett from the Office of Disease Prevention, as well as, as uh, the director, David Murray, for really putting this effort together and planning this meeting. I think it's a fantastic and important agenda that we're going to be talking about today. I don't have slides to present, but instead I just have three main points that I want to, to, um, to talk about as you go through the rest of the couple of days of this meeting. First of all, about 17% of Americans live in rural areas. I used to be amongst that group. I grew up in a small town in Kansas, and I know firsthand the issues that rural communities face, not least of which are those around health and burden of disease. At a meeting in the spring of 2019, uh, the, the spring before the pandemic, I heard these statistics. Heart disease is about 50, 56% higher in rural areas than in urban. Chronic respiratory disease is 75% higher in rural areas than in urban. And there are nearly 20,000 excess deaths from cancer per year in rural areas compared to urban. And since the 1980s, the divide between rural and urban mortality has widened. And that gap doesn't really show any sign of closing. And then, of course, when we do think about the pandemic, in the U.S. alone, we are approaching 44 million cases and have over 700,000 deaths from COVID-19, when only about 18 months ago it didn't exist. Now, especially in the first six to eight months of the pandemic, but we're still feeling it now, we all experienced issues around not being able to access care, have a shortage of health workers. We had delayed prevention and wellness services, including mental health and substance abuse services. 
And the CDC's morbidity and mortality weekly reports have indicated that mental health, substance use, and suicidal ideation are on the rise during the pandemic. Many adults are reporting specific negative impacts, such as difficulty sleeping or eating and worsening chronic conditions due to worry and stress over the coronavirus and the impact it has on our daily lives. And the rural health community and researchers know these issues all too well. And so we're really looking to this community to help us understand how we can break through the cycle and, and start to address these issues head on. All aspects of health are at play, even during the pandemic, and this is an important discussion to have. And speaking of substance use, in the last, uh, I guess it was about a year ago today, in October 2020, there was a report that showed all but two states were registering increased deaths, some of these states with up to 50% increases with an overall average of a 30% increase in substance use related deaths. And within the pandemic, therefore, there remains really a devastating epidemic. Since the Helping End Addiction Long-Term Program or HEAL program at the NIH, it launched a few years ago and there's a big push to find new treatments for the patients and communities severely affected by opioids and pain. And this is very important for us to continue to address. NIH's mission encompasses the idea of seeking fundamental knowledge about the nature of uh, and behavior of living systems and the application of that knowledge to enhance health and lengthen life and reduce illness and disability. And for the health of rural, um, rural Americans, we're here for the next few days because these areas are, are, are still in need of improvement. But technological advances give us some hope, and that's the second point that I want to mention today. How can we use technology advancement to improve health and health care for the rural and underserved populations? At NCATS, our mission is to turn scientific discoveries into health solutions, bringing more treatments to all people more quickly. And we accomplish that mission using a two-pronged approach. First, we do translational science, a discipline that seeks to make preclinical and clinical science more predictive. And then the second piece is we find and address the crimps in the drug development to clinical treatment pipeline. We're very familiar with how hard this is and understand that it's not often the scientific challenges that slow us down. It's the operational, administrative, and financial ones that are the most difficult and the most frustrating. But I want to highlight one area that is a game changer for the future of clinical research and has the promise to be a great equalizer for addressing health equity. And that's the use of electronic health records to look at risk and protective factors for COVID-19 outcomes. The centralized, secure national clinical data resource called the National COVID Cohort Collaborative, or N3C for short, it was developed and driven by the Clinical and Translational Science Award Program and joined up with the Idea State Clinical and Translational Research Program out of the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, along with federally qualified health centers, community health centers, and many others. This resource covers the pandemic, its evolution, and, and it's, it's there so that we can understand the current and long-term health consequences of COVID-19. As of now, this resource contains 8 million patient records with 2.7 million COVID positive cases, translating to 9 billion rows of data. I invite you to use Google and just Google N3C and the word dashboard to see if, you could, if, if, if this database can help your research. Access is open all researchers to address questions related to COVID-19. And just last week, Sally Hodder's team out of West Virginia University led by Alfred Anzalone posted a med archive paper using N3C showing that rural residents with COVID-19 were 40% more likely to be hospitalized or to die from COVID-19. And similar differences in mortality were noted for hospitalized patients without SARS-CoV-2 infections. For about a decade now, we've seen a linear increase in the number of publications related to telemedicine and rural health. And I can't think of a more important time to ensure that, that this technology is helping us advance everything that we do in clinical care. We've also seen an increased uptake of the use of mobile devices to conduct more health-related business. And that's good, but we need to do better. And this brings me to my last point. The speaker lineup for this workshop will talk about the scientific evidence to better understand what is and what is not known about the effectiveness in telehealth guided provider to provider communication to improve health outcomes in rural settings by addressing the key questions that are highlighted in the meeting website. 
And I also want to draw your attention to a paper that was published earlier this year by Shoshana Bardock and colleagues. They looked at how to use provider to provider telemedicine for Alzheimer's disease. And these findings, I think, are quite generalizable for why telemedicine is needed for improving caregiving for all. What they found was that the most common topical areas of questions related to risk factors, behavioral management, diagnosis, and medications. And so this study highlights the, the, the idea that rural caregivers have diverse educational needs and also have ways to contribute to the broader conversation, especially in a pandemic where we are learning things by the day. Rural communities may benefit from additional targeted resources addressing these common areas of unmet informational needs. And so my hope is for uh, that, that this workshop is not just a one time workshop, but that we can figure out a way to enable lots of, of, of small workshops, creating a continual learning environment to help maintain the momentum of dynamic dissemination and implementation approaches through the powerful tools like telemedicine. The urgency of the pandemic is definitely still here, and we need to continue to create the muscle memory of telehealth to advance other areas of rural health and for the betterment of and dissemination and implementation of rural health services. So thank you so much for listening, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of this conference and uh, and really set the stage for moving this this telemedicine peer to, uh, provider to provider communication forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rutter, for those opening remarks. We will keep in mind what you shared with us as we navigate through the next three days. Um, we will now hear the charge to the panel from Dr. David Murray. Uh, thank you, Kate. Uh, if I can have the next slide, please. Uh, a moment ago, I, mix, I mentioned the six strategic priorities that uh, the Office of Disease Prevention has in its current strategic plan. And I said that we were gonna focus today uh, on uh, the second priority, which is identifying research gaps. Next slide, please. Um, our goal today is to, and, and for the next three days, uh, is to assess the available scientific evidence through a systematic evidence review and, and a series of expert speaker presentations. Uh, we want to identify research gaps, identify future needs to better understand what is known about the effectiveness of telehealth guided provider to provider communication so that we can improve health outcomes in rural settings. Next slide. Uh, there are several pieces uh, to a P2P uh, workshop uh, uh, working behind the scenes. I, I'm familiar with all of these pieces, but uh, many of you will not be. Uh, there's a portfolio analysis that we do to find out what is NIH currently investing in uh, in terms of research related to the topic. Uh, we work with um, uh, AHRQ and their evidence-based practice centers to commission uh, a, a literature review and, and uh, evidence report, and you're gonna hear presentations on that later today. Um, we uh, identify speakers uh, who can give presentations uh, at the workshop. You'll hear those today and tomorrow. Um, and we invite audience participation. Um, normally, that means people stepping up to microphones and asking questions in the in the large auditorium where we have the meeting. Today, it means putting a question in the Q and A uh, box so that uh, we can relay the question to the panel members. And I will advise you that um, uh, speakers and panel members have access to that Q and A chat or Q and A box and can respond to questions as you put them in. Um, uh, so ask questions at any point. All of that input goes to an independent panel. Um, and we'll introduce the panel in a few moments. Uh, their assignment is to take in all of this information and then uh, develop a report that describes the research gaps and recommendations for advancing the field. Next slide, please. Um, uh, we have been interested in uh, finding out whether these pathways to prevention uh, workshops uh, have impact. And we look at that in a variety of ways. One of the things that we look at is uh, the uh, uh, influence that the publications that come out of these uh, workshops have. Um, as you may know, the evidence report is published, the panel report is published, and those pu publications do quite well in terms of measures of influence um, uh, relative to other papers that are indexed in uh, PubMed. Uh, here you see data for two prior workshops, uh, uh, myalgic encephalitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, and opioids and chronic pain. 
uh, any score above 3.45 means that the paper was in the top 5% of all papers indexed in PubMed. So all of our um, reports from these two conferences uh, met that threshold. And a score above 7.8 means that it's in the top 1%. And so both reports that came out of the opioid and chronic pain uh, workshop uh, met that criteria. So the uh, materials that come out of these workshops are influential uh, and uh, lead to uh, a variety of new activities, including uh, funding opportunity announcements from NIH for new research to fill the evidence gaps that are identified. Next slide, please. Uh, there are a number of uh, key people uh, who have important roles in the P2P workshop. Uh, my office plays a coordinating role, so Kate Winsick is the lead uh, for today's workshop, but there are many others, uh, ODP staff uh, behind the scenes uh, who've been involved in this. We have representatives from the sponsoring uh, institutes and centers who work closely with ODP uh, to develop the idea for the conference. They actually propose it to us uh, and go through a series of um, uh, back and forth uh, conversations to decide whether we're going to move ahead with that particular uh, idea. And certainly we did with this one. Uh, the agency leads uh, and the content area experts who are other NIH uh, uh, staff uh, are the ones who identify the speakers and uh, work out the agenda uh, for the meeting. Uh, and then I'll say a, a bit more about the Evidence-Based Practice Center and the independent panel members uh, in the next slide. So if I can advance one, please. The Evidence-Based Practice Center uh, conducts a systematic evidence review. So this is a literature review uh, through a conduct contract with uh, AHRQ. Uh, we pay for it uh, through an interagency agreement. And in this case, the Pacific Northwest EPC at Oregon Health and Science University conducted uh, the evidence review for this workshop. We will hear from Annette Toten and Dana Womack on the findings of the review uh, for each of the four key questions. Next slide, please. Uh, the independent panel uh, plays a critical role in this meeting, uh, and I want to emphasize independent. We pick these people because they are not uh, actively uh, conducting research in the content uh, that we're talking about for the next three days. And some people ask, why not? Why don't you have experts on, on uh, rural health telecommunications? Well, uh, we don't want them to, be, to have any biases in any way. Uh, so we bring experts in methodology, experts in clinical practice, experts in academic research and public health, um, and they come together and uh, serve as the independent panel without uh, having uh, any ax to grind because they're actively working in the content area. And they produce a report synthesizing the findings, detailing recommendations for future research. Next slide. Um, I, my charge to the panel is very simple. I ask, please listen to all of the workshop proceedings, attend all of the executive writing sessions, uh, draft the panel report uh, shortly after the workshop is complete. Um, in the old days, we would have um, uh, the panel holed up in a room at a hotel or an NIH conference center and working late into the night on this. In this instance, we're gonna be doing that uh, electronically, uh, but it's still important that the report be drawn together uh, soon after the end of the meeting. Uh, the report is then posted on the ODP website and available for public comment. And we also ask the panel to look very closely at those comments that we receive and incorporate them into the uh, uh, final report uh, that identifies research gaps and, and uh, future research priorities. Um, next slide, please. Uh, at this point, I would like to introduce the panel members, and I would ask the panel members to turn their video cameras on uh, so that we can see you and the audience can see you. Uh, the, and this is the first time that uh, anyone has outside of the planning group has seen the list of uh, members of the panel. Uh, Dr. Mary Wakefield is uh, our chair, panel chair. Uh, she's in the School of Nursing at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, Dr. Uh, Joanne Conroy is president of Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. Uh, Dr. Sarah McLafferty uh, is at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, Dr. Robert Moser is at the University of Kansas School of Medicine. Um, Dr. Uh, Velma McBride-Murray is at Vanderbilt University Medical uh, Center. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jayashri uh, Sankaranandan is uh, at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And uh, Dr. Rebecca Slipkin is at the Gillings School of Public Health, University of North Carolina. 
Next slide, please. Uh, all the panelists uh, have um, been judged to have no conflicting relationships pertinent to the material that we're covering in this workshop. And the speakers have been asked to disclose any uh, conflicts uh, and to read those disclosures as part of their presentations. Please refer to the disclosure statements included as part of the speakers' bios on the workshop website for further information. Next slide, please. Uh, we had over 850 registrants uh, as of Friday. I didn't see an updated number today. I suspect it's higher. Um, we have registrants from all 49 states, 22 countries. Uh, we have three keynote speakers who will provide um, important uh, viewpoints on rural telehealth. Uh, we have an opening stakeholder panel that will provide a three-prong perspective uh, representing policy, healthcare delivery, and research. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, closing my charge to the panel, uh, I want to say thank you uh, to uh, the uh, Institute uh, leads uh, listed here. Um, I want to um, thank uh, our friends at AHRQ for all of the work that they've done, particularly the Pacific Northwest EPC uh, at Oregon Health Sciences um, uh, University. I want to thank the speakers and the panel members, um, our uh, logistical support contractor, Westat, uh, and certainly my own staff who's uh, worked so hard to get this meeting organized. So thank you to uh, everyone identified on this slide. Uh, my next assignment is to uh, introduce Dr. Mary Wakefield, uh, who is the panel chair, as our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Wakefield is um, a visiting professor at Georgetown University and professor at the University of Texas at Austin. She currently serves on a number of nonprofit advisory boards, including the Macy Foundation and the Medical Advisory Board for the University of Washington. Dr. Wakefield is a member of the National Academy of Medicine and a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing. Most recently, she co-chaired the National Academy of Medicine's consensus study report on the future of nursing, 2020 to 2030. Dr. Wakefield's career has included public service in the legislative and executive branches of government. Uh, she served as the administrator of the US, U.S. Health Resources and Services Administration and was appointed by President Barack Obama as the acting deputy secretary of Health and Human Services, our, our home department, HHS. In these notes, in these roles, she led efforts to strengthen health services and programs in medically underserved communities. She has also worked uh, on President Biden's transition team, the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, the National Advisory Committee in uh, HRSA's Office of Rural Health Policy, and the National Advisory Council for the Agency of Healthcare Research and Quality. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Wake. Thanks so much, Dr. Murray. I really appreciate uh, the introduction and your facilitating through your office and your staff uh, uh, much of the work that we'll be discussing today. Uh, welcome, everyone. We're delighted uh, to have you join us uh, virtually. Next slide, please. In terms of dis disclosures, I don't have any to report. Next slide. Dr. Murray has already shared with you the uh, membership on the independent panel. I just want to add that these individuals listed here have a range of important and relevant background. Uh, they, I want to thank them personally for their engagement. We have had a number of meetings coming into this one, and we'll be having a number more meetings uh, following this as well it, to produce the report that was uh, that will be developed and that was referenced earlier. Uh, many thanks to each of them. You will be hearing from them. Uh, for those of you who are attendees to today's meeting, you will be hearing from them uh, throughout today, tomorrow, uh, and day three as they pose questions and share observations uh, related to each one of the research questions. Um, next slide. Just to give you a little bit of background on, on what this panel has been engaged in and what they'll be doing uh, going forward, uh, just a quick overview of some of our activities. First of all, in advance of today's meeting, the uh, independent panel has read the systematic evidence review that uh, was produced by the EPC. Uh, we've had an extensive review of that material and engaged in conversation about various features of it uh, prior to coming into today. We also today will be considering the evidence uh, uh, from the speakers and hearing and paying attention to the comments that we receive uh, from the broader audience from all of you today as well. 
following uh, this three day meeting, we will be working diligently to draft that panel report that Dr. Murray mentioned just a moment ago. And in that panel report, we will summarize the current scientific literature related to the topic we're all here to discuss and learn more about. We will, in that report, be addressing some of the evidence uh, that has been uh, lifted up by the speakers uh, through these uh, across rather these three days, and we will be outlining uh, gaps and then making associated recommendations uh, for future research uh, needed in this area. And as part of that, we'll be highlighting what needs to be prioritized uh, to really advance this field uh, um, uh, going into the future. In terms of the process, we will be producing that draft panel report, and it will be, as was mentioned earlier, open for public comment for 30 days. Then we'll come back and finalize that report based on uh, uh, comments that would have been received. And the final uh, panel report, as well as the EPC report, will be published uh, in tandem uh, in a peer-reviewed journal. So that's sort of a quick summary of the activities we've engaged in to date and also what is uh, ahead of us. And, and the reason why you uh, heard me a minute ago uh, uh, thanking uh, the independent panel members who have been engaging this work and, and will continue to do so. With that, next slide, please. So the structure for this workshop uh, today and over the course of the next uh, two days that will follow, after this morning's introduction uh, and um, a, a couple of the um, uh, um, the opening remarks uh, that you'll be hearing uh, and a, a quick moderated panel. The first uh, talk for each of the sessions will summarize the relevant uh, systematic evidence review. So as we take each question, each of the, the, the um, uh, workshop questions, and start to drill down on the associated content. We'll begin those sessions with the summary of the EPC's relevant uh, uh, evidence associated with that question. And then again, following that EPC uh, systematic evidence review uh, uh, discussion or summary, you will hear the speakers um, uh, uh, addressing the research gaps associated with that research question and providing other relevant information. And then following each of those sessions that relate again to each one of the research questions, uh, we will end with a discussion period uh, and we'll be um, engaging in that uh, discussion period first by opening the floor to the panelists, the independent panel members, so that we can ensure that we get the information that we need uh, from uh, engaging with the uh, various speakers. And then as time permits, we will open this uh, uh, more broadly to uh, individuals that are participating as attendees in the panel. Next um, slide, please. As I mentioned, following each one of the sessions, uh, presenters, the panelists will be allowed to ask their questions first. And um, uh, they may have only one or two questions. They may have multiple questions, just depending. Uh, but regardless, there won't be a time limit on their asking questions. So again, as I mentioned earlier, as we have time, the audience will be able to ask questions as well and comments can be considered after the questions from the panelists have been addressed. Um, speakers may answer questions as you have them, you meaning the attendees for today, uh, that are not read aloud. Uh, the speakers may answer those audience questions in the Q&A pod. So again, uh, you wanna pay attention to that Q&A pod in the lower right hand uh, um, part of your screen if you have a question of a speaker, because that's where you'll see uh, answers to them. If you are an attendee, and if we're unable to get to your questions, uh, you can drop questions in there at any point in time. If we're unable to get your questions in the kind of one in the discussion session uh, following uh, the independent panelists, uh, you'll note from the agenda that there are breaks we will be taking and then uh, coming back, hopefully um, as close to on time as, as we possibly can get. Next slide and last slide for me. Uh, Kate had mentioned uh, some of these points earlier, I believe, but just again to remind all of you, particularly the attendees, for questions or comments that you've got about the content uh, from uh, panelists or uh, some of our keynote presenters, you've got that Q&A pod again in the lower right hand uh, uh, part of your uh, screen. Also, uh, for technical issues with WebEx, as Kate had mentioned earlier, 
you've got the chat pod and you can, if you've got any kind of a technical question or concern or issue, um, you should just drop that in the chat pod. That's also in your lower right hand side of your screen. And then on the uh, slide, you can see other options for providing feedback related to today's uh, presentations. And in addition to the survey that Kate had mentioned earlier, that's it for me. Welcome again, everyone. We're delighted you're here and I'll pass it back. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, now that we've highlighted our panel activities, we will start with the first presentation by the scientific, the agency scientific leads who have helped to play in this workshop. Uh, and first will be from Dr. Um, from Mr. Tom Morris on the overview of the workshop topic and a review of key questions. And I just want to remind everybody, if you have questions, send them to the Q&A pod on the lower right hand corner of your screen and any technical support issues um, should be put in the chat pod. Uh, Mr. Morris, go right ahead. Okay, thank you so much and thank you to NIH for uh, focusing this workshop on rural, on rural issues and especially thanks to Kate and Melissa and Maria and my fellow panelists uh, for all the work in making this happen. Um, what I'd like to do is just set a quick context for rural uh, to underpin our discussion. So next slide. Uh, just, I have nothing to disclose, so we can move to the next slide. Uh, let me set a little context for uh, where I work in the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. We have a unique uh, job within the Department of Health and Human Services in the sense that we're statutorily charged with advising the Secretary on rural issues that cut across HHS, and yet we're located in the Health Resources and Services Administration because we operate a number of grant programs that, like the rest of HRSA, are very much focused on underrepresented populations and access to care issues. And so, in that context, we, we get to not only work on policy issues uh, at the department level, but then also operate a number of grant programs that are all built around capacity support in rural communities. Next slide. So, as Dr. Rudder noted, there's a number of distinguishing factors uh, when you talk about rural health care, and I'd like to add just a few to the points she made. You know, the, none of these will be a surprise to anybody on this call. We have a shortage of primary care practitioners in rural, and those shortages are even more acute when you get into areas like behavioral health, substance use, and or access to oral health care. Um, and so these are ongoing issues, not only in getting these clinicians to rural communities, but retaining them there. Um, number of, of distinguishing factors such as higher mortality, maternal mortality for women, uh, higher rates of chronic disease uh, and, and uh, risky health behaviors. Um, we've got a very uh, vulnerable infrastructure. We've had 138 rural hospitals close since 2010, several hundred more at a high rate of financial distress. Um, distance to care can be a real factor in rural communities, especially for specialty care and higher rates of uninsured. And for the folks that, that do have coverage, they're more often uh, get coverage through public programs like Medicare, Medicaid, or the Children's Health Insurance Program. Next slide. Uh, so, given all those factors, it, it should be no surprise to anybody that um, what we've seen for the last few years in terms of higher rates of, of, of avoidable or excess death for each of the five leading causes of death, um, and you know, none of these again are, are a surprise, but but they do sort of present a backdrop for us. And a context I think is important to consider because they do speak to the complexity of conditions that your average primary care practitioner in a rural community is taking care of on a daily basis. Next slide. And then, you know, we talked a little bit, of, uh, the NIH folks talked a little bit about the, the work they're doing in opioids, and obviously it's hit rural communities as hard as it's hit urban communities. Um, the difference being, I think, is the lack of treatment infrastructure in rural communities. And the pandemic has certainly set our efforts back. In the past years, we can see um, that during that isolation, higher rates of overdose deaths uh, were true in both rural and urban areas, and will probably continue uh, during the continued part of the pandemic. Next slide. Um, it's important to understand the infrastructure we're dealing with in rural communities in terms of what's there clinically. Um, rural areas are heavily dependent on small and rural hospitals, and of the 2,000 or so rural hospitals, 1,300 plus are considered critical access hospital, meaning they have 25 beds or fewer, low average daily census. Um, but in addition to that, um, you know, rural health clinics and community health centers make up the primary care infrastructure more often than not in rural communities. And this map sort of illustrates that. And you can see there are some geographic patterns to it. So, 
you know, where you are in the country may often dictate what sort of clinical infrastructure you have. Next slide. Um, obviously, you know, at, at HRSA, we've been funding telehealth for more than 25 years, and we know what a lifeline it can be in rural communities, whether we're talking about teleconsults or we're talking more broadly about other ways like provider-to-provider -provider communication that it can support rural clinicians and the patients they serve. And, and thankfully, you know, during the pandemic, telehealth has really emerged as a lifeline for many communities, both in rural and urban areas. And um, that was made possible, I think, due to the fact that the, the department was able to offer a number of public health emergency uh, flexibilities in terms of the regulations, but also some at the state level in terms of licensure. Uh, HHS has stood up a number of telehealth resources during the pandemic. And more recently, we've elevated the role of the Office for the Advancement of Telehealth to a standalone office in recognition of the important role that telehealth is playing uh, you know, in this country right now. And the, the OAT director, uh, Heather Damaris, has led efforts to create a new centralized uh, website at HHS that um, you know, allows a single point of entry for the breadth of activities that's taken across, across the department. Next slide. Um, so the growth in, in at least at HRSA in telehealth preceded the pandemic, um, and it's really expanded across every part of our agency. Um, and I think that's true across the department as well. Um, but if you look at particularly all the activities we have in this slide, you, you'll see a great deal of the work we're doing at HRSA falls into this uh, broader rubric of provider-to-provider communication. For example, more than 550 of the awards cited here are for distance learning type projects, most like Project ECHO or, 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 or similar efforts. Next slide. And I think it's also worth noting that the interest in telehealth cuts across the department, but also is a particular focus of the, of the administration. And they brought together folks from across the cabinet level agencies, as well as the FCC, because of they want a, a focus on telehealth issues. And so I think our timing on this is really important given the White House interest in this. And they're examining issues like reimbursement, access to broadband, licensure, it really runs the gamut. And so the discussion over the next few days, I think, uh, and the products from this workshop are going to find a very receptive audience in terms of both the White House and the department. Next slide. And so as we drill down on this, uh, uh, this issue of provider-provider communication, I can tell you that it's, a, it's an important issue for my office and for the rural communities we work with. Uh, these relationships are really important when you consider how isolated geographically many primary care providers are. And so the ability to take part in a, in a consultative process uh, with a specialist when managing a unique condition really is, a, is, a, is, is an essential part of how they practice care. And all anything we can do to sort of support those relationships is critically important, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship between two clinicians or whether it's in a larger format like we see often in the Project ECHO type activities. And that's true for primary care practitioners, nurse, uh, physician assistants, uh, mental health providers, nurse practitioners, it really runs the gamut. And to the extent that those clinicians are supported, it then also helps address issues related to recruitment and retainment of clinicians in rural communities. Uh, at the same time, we know the evidence base is somewhat limited here, and there are a host of financial and operational challenges in sort of making this work given busy clinician schedules and accounting for the realities of, of, of what the clinician is dealing with upstream. Um, so, hopefully over the next couple of days, we'll, we'll dive a lot deeper into this and then the products coming out of it will really inform this moving forward. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Zinji Zhang uh, from the National Institutes of Health. Thanks, Tom. Morning. Uh, next slide, please. I don't have any uh, financial images to disclose. Next slide. Um, as Tom highlighted in his previous presentation, rural urban health inequities have been recognized and extensively documented for several decades. In recent years, changing demographics and emerging epidemics, including the opioid crisis, HIV epidemic, and the rural suicide catastrophe, have further underscored the need to address healthcare access and quality disparities facing rural populations. Next slide, please. COVID-19 death rate in rural America now double that of urban communities. As you can see from the CDC data here, the COVID-19 incidence trends by rural urban areas flipped over the time 
showing a rapid spread of COVID-19 from large cities to rural communities during that time. The situation was exacerbated with the closing of rural hospitals and shortage of rural healthcare workforce and ICUs. More than 20% of rural hospitals, mostly in South, were predicted to be at high risk or mid high risk of financial distress in 2019. Communities served by at risk rural hospitals usually have large percentages of non whites, lower socioeconomic status, and worse health outcomes than their counterparts. There is a clear need for healthcare innovation, including telemedicine in rural Africa. However, Rural patients who are older, racial ethnic minorities, or did not speak English had a much lower odds of completing a telemedicine visit using video. Those who had less education, were unemployed, were retired, or had a disability, were more likely to face a challenge adopting telemedicine for their healthcare needs. Next slide, please. Recent advances in health information technology especially big data science, mobile health, and artificial intelligence hold great promise for improving health outcomes. However, we need to assure active efforts are made up front during both the planning and the implementing stages of big data science, mobile health, artificial intelligence programs and projects to address disparities reduction, to prevent potential disparities, instead of increasing the disparity gaps. For example, more and more people have recognized broadband internet access as a social determinant of health, especially for rural Americans. It also becomes critical to improve interoperability, data integration, and health information exchange in under-resourced rural health centers. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. NH Pathway to Prevention Workshop Planning Team has acquired data from a brief portfolio summary of projects related to workshop using NH Reporter and iSearch databases. We identified projects supported by NIH, AHRQ, SAMHSA, FERSA, PICORI, VA, and CDC. Next slide, please. So here is a form tree representing key elements of activities funded by NIH from 2016 to 2020, including networking and information technology R&D, social determinants of health, women's health, mental health, primary care, stroke, etc. This was generated through elements from the public health relevance, health, RCDC categories mentioned in projects and activities. More detailed data and analysis will be released later. That concludes my uh, presentation. I will now hand over to my colleague from the National Center for Advancing Translational Science, Dr. Audi Atienza. He will provide examples from NCATS. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. Next slide. Again, my name is Dr. Audi Atienza from NCATS, and Dr. Morris and Dr. Zhang had provided the background of the importance of rural health and telehealth. Uh, I've been asked to provide a, uh, a, a perspective from NCATS on the importance of rural health and telehealth. And first, I would like to say uh, it is an uh, honor to present uh, NCATS pers perspective, as well as an honor for NCATS to co-sponsor this really important meeting. Next slide, please. I have no disclosures uh, to report. Next slide. So for those who are not familiar with NCATS, uh, NCATS funds the Clinical and Translational Science Award Program. And this CTSA program, for short, supports a national network of medical research institutions 61 of them currently across the United States, and they work together as a network to improve the translational research process. And as Dr. Rudder had noted, the goal really is to get more treatments to all patients more quickly. 
and to accelerate the pace of research so that the biomedical sciences can inform future treatments. Next slide, please. Within the CTSA program, the NCATS funds a number of collaborative innovation awards and several of these collaborative innovation awards and several of the projects really focus on rural health. For example, uh, Washington, Wyoming, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho, would call whammy region, established a practice and research network. Um, and that network over the past 10 years um, has funded uh, more than 80 projects, has generated over 60 publication, and has uh, been good at um, establishing uh, and gaining 200 grant applications related to rural health. And here are a number of examples uh, of the different networks, the different projects that NCATS has, has uh, funded. Next slide, please. In addition, several of the hubs in the CTSA network have what they call optional cores. And several of these cores also uh, are uh, related to rural health and address rural health issues. For example, the University of Kentucky CTSA program um, funds the Appalachian Translational Research Network uh, that's comprised of Ohio State University, University of Cincinnati, University of Kentucky, Penn State University, and Wake Forest as a way to address translational uh, issues in rural health and improve health in these regions. Next slide, please. NCATS also focuses on telehealth in several of the hubs. Uh, for example, the University of New Mexico, as part of their community engagement core, funds the, the Project ECHO. Um, and Project ECHO focuses specifically on provider to provider telehealth and its reach is not only nationwide, but also global. Next slide. In addition, another collaborative innovation award is the Sprout Award. And this is a award that has been uh, awarded to the Medical University of South Carolina that involves over 120 institutions in 36 states and four countries to address pediatric telehealth across the United States and globally. Next slide. So I'm gonna pass this on to, uh, to Tony uh, and just wanna say, we hope that you will be able to uh, have further discussions about how we can leverage these networks and these, the current work being considered at NCATS um, for uh, advancing provider to provider telehealth in the US and globally. Thank you. Thank you, Hardy. <clears throat> and thank you everybody for, for attending the meeting. I'm Tony Punturieri. I'm a program officer in the Division of Lung Diseases at the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute. And I title my brief uh, um, uh, exercise uh, uh, from organ to whole body for better patient care. It is understood that we are here to deliver provider to provider thoughts, but ultimately who they are have to target as my predecessors already mentioned is the patient. And the patient and not as a, a carrier of a single disease, but a patient uh, uh, as a whole. Uh, many Tony, disease- please remember to put your video on, uh, turn on your video. Thank you, sorry to interrupt you. Here I am, sorry. And so many diseases affect the same person. Next slide. This is my disclosure, nothing to disclose. So um, next slide, please. I'm gonna give you a few examples that are relating to uh, obviously what does this mean for, for a patient and for a patient that, that uh, lives in, in rural America. First example is pregnancy, and pregnancy is a stress uh, is, that identifies women with long-term risk of trajectory for heart disease. You can see on, on the left panel, the one in blue, 
among the common risk factors are high blood pressure, diet, obesity, diabetes, genetics, of course, smoking, alcohol, and stress. But clearly, the central panel shows that the change in demographic and health profile of pregnant women impact their future risk of heart disease. Um, for example, older maternal age, increasing prevalence of comorbid condition, again, hypertension, obesity, diabetes. Next slide, please. But then when we look at, at the gap, at the disparity that exists between uh, rural and urban, uh, the, the data are staggering. The first panel on the left, the one uh, with the reddish, uh, depicts uh, uh, women of age 35 and plus uh, that have heart disease. And uh, you can see where the spread is, where, where, where the higher rates of disease are. And uh, when you compare that with maternal mortality in the US, which is the, blue, the bluish panel in the centers, again, uh, there is an easy overlap with the two maps. And the third panel on the, li on the, on the right uh, shows clearly where preeclampsia and eclampsia are hitting more, and they're hitting uh, clearly uh, uh, under third population uh, in uh, racial and, and, and ethnical uh, minorities. So prevention and preemption of disease uh, in regions with high incidence of, 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 and pre, of for example, of, of maternal um, morbidity and mortality and preeclampsia can have long-term health benefit for the health of, of the population at risk. Next slide. And uh, as you may know, the trends in prevalence of maternal pre-pregnancy hypertension are uh, Two parallel lines that you can see here, the blue line on the top is what happens in rural America and, and the li two lines below are urban and overall for, for, for average. And this gap, uh, this, these are data that go back from 2007 all the way to 2018, with actually a tendency, I do not have data for 2019, of, of an increase in, in, in the past years. Next slide. But this is not only true for, for a cardiovascular disease, uh, for, for preeclampsia, this is true also for respiratory diseases. And again, this map is familiar, where uh, the map on the, on the left is showing where chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, so an obstructive uh, lung disease, is more prevalent in the United States. And if you look at that panel on the right, uh, the, 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 panel in the middle of that panel shows that uh, the prevalence is highest in rural areas, almost double the one that is in large metro area, 8.2% versus 4.7%. Next slide, please. This is also compounded by where the doctors are, where the specialists are. And this is true for this disease, but it's true for all the other diseases. So in, in this case, the location of, of specialized doctors in, in, in pulmonary disease is clearly not in rural America. And these are data from published from, from CDC. Um, and this, these are the, the red dots, presence of pulmonologists, and they overlap with the map, like the one that I showed you before, where the disease is more prevalent. And, and we can see there are large swaths of the country that are absolutely not covered. Another factor is, next slide please, is that uh, a, a, a therapy that is proven to be really effective for patients with this pulmonary disease is not accessible. This is uh, pulmonary rehabilitation, and the dots are, are uh, representing um, respiratory services that could deliver pulmonary rehabilitation. And once again, you see, and you can imagine how many miles a patient should run through to, to get to a center that can deliver pulmonary rehabilitation. Next slide. As you know, in September of 2020, the HHS launched an initiative to track physician use and burdens of health IT. Prior research found that approximately 80% of office-based physicians use a certified electronic health record, but only one in 10 of those reported that they were able to electronically send, receive, find, and integrate healthcare data outside of their networks. So interoperability is clearly one of the keywords. 
under the, this uh, cooperative agreement, the American Board of Family Me Medicine intends to develop key me measures related to health IT use and interoperability, collect data from a national representative sample of office-based physicians to support the progress, and collaborate with ONC on the analysis and interpretation of, of the survey results. All this is also substantiated by by uh, recent uh, uh, surveys that actually came out just uh, in the past month, a month and a half, one from the American Medical Association on policy research perspective that, that shows that uh, uh, there was widespread use across most physician specialties and for variety of function of telehealth. But at the same time, there was a survey published from J.D. Power that said uh, I, we saw a surge in telehealth use from 7% in 2019 to 36% in 2021, reflecting, of course, the shift uh, as the nation grappled with COVID-19, but also saw a decrease in patient satisfaction, driven by complaints over limited services, lack of awareness of costs, confusion technology requirement, and lack of information about uh, uh, care by providers. And finally, a, a third survey um, uh, showed, again, just published, showed that hospital and health system are planning to increase telehealth investment. More than half of hospital and health system leaders say they are planning to increase their investment. But clearly, growth and investment uh, needs to be uh, targeted, and uh, they, they need to have a platform consolidation as, as a target. It's not just a question of delivering care, but it's a question of delivering equal care. Next slide. And so these are the uh, workshop key questions that, that are going to be tackled during this three days workshop. The first one is what is the uptake of different types of P2P telehealth in rural high areas? The second is what is the effective provider to provider telehealth for rural patients? The third is what strategies are effective and what are the barriers and facilitators to implementation and sustainability of P2P telehealth in rural areas? And finally, what are the methodological weaknesses of P2P telehealth for rural patients and what improvements in study designs, for example, focusing on relevant comparison and outcomes may increase the impact of future research. I thank you for your attention and uh, I, um, I think my the next speaker is Dr. Uh, Wakefield. I, I, think, I think you're muted. Thank you. Yep, I was muted. Uh, thank you uh, for each of you for presenting that insightful background and scope and highlighting <clears throat> NIH, HRSA, and CDC's uh, research and investment in rural telehealth. Uh, so thanks to each of you for those presentations. So we will now shift our focus to our first keynote presentation uh, titled Bridging Healthcare Gaps in Culture and Geography Through Telehealth, uh, Lessons from Tribal Communities, given by Dr. Spiro Manson. Welcome, Dr. Manson. Thank you very much, Dr. Wakefield. Uh, thank you as well to the planners of the workshop, the sponsors, as well as those who have joined us today, and the opportunity to share with you uh, the lessons that we've learned since 1998, nearly two and a half decades of working in American Indian Alaska Native communities across the country in some of the most isolated and rural, as well as impoverished uh, settings, as one might imagine anywhere in the globe. Um, my remarks will begin by focusing initially on the um, brief history of uh, telehealth in American Indian Alaska Native communities. I will, however, for the most part, focus unashamedly on uh, telepsychiatry, which has been our particular area of experience and effort over those two and a half decades. I'll then highlight for you some of the three or four major systems of telehealth and specifically telepsychiatry that are at work in American Indian Alaska Native communities. And then I will move to our particular experiences. And those experiences inform a developmental model that I, my colleague, Dr. James Shore, also here at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus, 
and I began to develop in terms of six specific stages that are incremental in focus, but also specific in task that uh, have informed our efforts in terms of developing these kinds of services in such communities. I will then turn to some of the administrative lessons that emerged during that process, but I will conclude by what I believe are some of the major research challenges um, and with a very specific emphasis on not only patient provider and program, but also organizational capacity and readiness to collaborate in the context of provider to provider. Next slide, please. Though probably familiar to most of us in the audience, but still well worth acknowledging that this particular field and modality of delivery and all of its variants really has its roots uh, in 1959 and the initial seminal efforts at the University of Nebraska when they began uh, what seems now extremely rudimentary, but at that time was uh, at the outer edges of innovation and creativity of expanding these kinds of resources, um, particularly in the area of telepsychiatry uh, beyond the office and uh, specialty care centers at the University of Nebraska um, to rural parts of Nebraska itself and notably the particular state hospital there that was in need of this kind of specialty uh, care and uh, attention uh, to their patients who otherwise with absent these kinds of resources uh, would um, proceed in their treatment without the benefit of such guidance. Next slide, please. Telehealth actually has its initial origins in uh, StarPAC, which was a NASA-funded and supported uh, initiative among the Papago, known then, Tohono Otham today at present. Uh, StarPAC represents an acronym of Space Technology Applied to the Rural Papago Advanced Healthcare, in which you can see here in the upper left-hand corner of this particular slide, the actual mobile van, and in within that van, you can see um, a health assistant together with a mother and a newborn at work and trying to understand and decipher the nature of the health challenges that that newborn faced, um, benefiting from the uh, consultation liaison provided by healthcare professionals at a distance. Next slide, please. Today, we see a dramatic growth, um, both in terms of the spectrum of services, the uh, breadth and depth of those services, as well as the sophistication of services. Probably the most um, sophisticated is the Afghan effort um, presented by the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium headquartered in Anchorage, Alaska, in which there are a variety of different um, telemedicine modalities that are mobilized to address uh, a full range of different kinds of health problems that Alaska Native and American Indian people face. And without the reach of Afghan would not have the benefit of the kind of specialty assessment and care that this particular modality offers. I might note that Afghan actually builds upon the very rudimentary uh, initial portable radio and ultimately landlines uh, that were established with community health associates in these rural distance villages and that evolved today to the level of sophistication we see represented here. Next slide, please. The Indian Health Service itself has a growing and increasingly a sophisticated platform for telebehavioral health um, operated out of its office in the Southwest, but now spreading, spreading to over 22 sites uh, in the lower 48 depicted here, in which um, both um, patient provider, provider to private consultation groups and other kinds of therapeutic activities are supported by this particular modality. Next slide, please. The third major uh, effort is also is represented by the Office of Rural Health Veterans Rural Health Resource Center, the Western Region, headquartered in Salt Lake City. The native domain, which is located in our offices at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus, affiliated with the Centers for American Indian Alaska Native Health, which I have the privilege of directing, 
uh, has established nine major uh, telepsychiatry clinics to reach out to and address the needs of American Indian and Alaska Native veterans of all eras who suffer from a wide variety of different kinds of health consequences of an adverse nature that follow from their role in the military combat and otherwise. Next slide, please. These particular uh, efforts have been codified and with a series of guidelines for the actual practice of telemental health. Uh, here represented by um, a major um, set of guidelines issued by the American Telemedicine Association. Though we had a hand in assisting a the ATA in developing these particular guidelines, should be noted that in fact, we were a bit frustrated by the lack of attention to the social and cultural dynamics that underpin the nature of both patient provider, provider to provider and organizational uh, aspects of the development, um, implementation and maintenance of these kinds of systems of care, which led to, next slide please, our own particular efforts um, for supported by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration to focus heavily on the social and cultural context in which such services are rendered and to appreciate, next slide please, the um, particular challenges that one faces, not just back up if you would, thank you, not just in terms of isolation and, and geography, but also in terms of the uh, cultural differences that may, and in our experience, frequently do emerge uh, in the context of attempting to deliver these services, not just from provider to patient and between providers of different social and cultural backgrounds and disciplinary training, but also different organizations that are rooted in very, very different views of the world and business practices. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, we at the Centers for American and Alaska Native Health began our efforts uh, in 1998, and it became uh, institutionalized in 2002 uh, with the establishment of our first major uh, telepsychiatry program between our programs located in Aurora, Colorado, and the Rosebud and Lakota uh, reservations in South Central South Dakota. Um, this particular program focused initially on veterans, but gave rise to a host of programs um, folk employing video conferencing, store and forward, uh, types of modalities, as well as consultation uh, models, liaison models that I'll describe briefly in a moment, and also grew in terms of the particular uh, patient populations and the settings in which these deliver the services were delivered. Next slide, please. So that today, uh, there are approximately 15 or 16 different types of services that we've established um, throughout the northern Midwest and uh, to some extent uh, in the Southwest and particularly into Alaska. These cover services of an uh, outpatient um, based nature with American Indian Alaska Native veterans uh, who as a consequence of their service have many of them have experienced um, uh, traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress disorder accompanied by substance abuse comorbidities. We also have expanded in the last 12 years to include um, telepsychiatry uh, services to adult residential alcohol treatment programs, notably in Alaska, and we now number four of those programs in which dual disorders, that is not just simply substance abuse or substance use disorders are a major concern, but also the accompanying um, mental illnesses such as depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and anxiety that one frequently finds in association with subs um, substance use disorders. And two, our efforts expanded uh, to focus on child inpatient psychiatric services. Next slide, please. These, folk, these particular uh, services basically follow four different kinds of clinical models. The veteran services that I described at the outset uh, employ tribal outreach workers, think of them as community health 
workers uh, who really are the glue in these communities, individuals uh, who know the community well, uh, who are well connected, uh, who are seen as appropriate local champions, often informal leaders in these communities, uh, who reach out to those veterans in need of these kinds of services and develop an initial alliance that increases the likelihood that they will actually come to the office-based settings in which these telepsychiatric services are offered. Uh, these uh, clinical models in this particular uh, arena are also characterized by multiple organizational partnerships. And this is a theme that I will return to frequently that is absolutely critical to appreciating the challenges and to anticipating the models of success which vary from one community to the next in bringing these partners uh, into uh, partnership with one another. Also, too, uh, there's a very important emphasis on coordinating the systems of care themselves. Um, often the services may or, or, uh, originate within a particular um, organization, such as the Veterans Administration or the Indian Health Service, or perhaps a tribal uh, health care organization, but it cannot, in our experience, stand alone in that regard and for reasons of continuity and quality and coordination of care must uh, coordinate very closely with its other organizational partners to ensure the adequacy of such uh, efforts. And likely and perhaps, perhaps uniquely in the experience of this knowledge, our services in the, this particular context also reach out to and work with traditional healers in American Indian and Alaska Native communities in which our early efforts were able to demonstrate to the Veterans Administration the efficacy of tribal ceremonies and rituals in combination with biomedical services uh, to the benefit of the patients that we served. That led in turn uh, to our work with incorporating in a culturally and socially appropriate ways traditional healers who vary substantially uh, in terms of their focus and practice across these tribal communities. The second major model, clinical model that we've engaged in over time is a geriatric integrated care model in which was largely case consultation uh, oriented. Um, it employed trainees and of course, prior presenters have talked about the importance of ECHO and the grand round style format of consultation liaison and case conferencing that's central to the ECHO format. The third particular clinical model that we've engaged in is adult residential alcohol um, programs. Uh, this is a team-based approach in which our psychiatrists and a variety of, of uh, psychiatric professionals, psychiatric nurses, social workers, and uh, clinical psychologists come together working with substance abuse and use trained uh, counselors of varying degrees of preparation at the local health programs um, to uh, provide um, sophisticated assessment uh, position the program to be able to um, understand and to prescribe and monitor uh, appropriate pharmacologic interventions um, and to embed that within appropriate uh, cultural models of care, which is extremely important, particularly when you're working in communities such as these that have a long history of 12-step programs uh, that often run counter to um, acceptance of pharmacologic uh, interventions uh, in the addressing the needs of their particular consumers or, or patients. Also, too, this particular model in our uh, experience has emphasized staff in supervision, training, and consultation hand in hand with the patient focused uh, intervention. And the fourth major model uh, that these different services represent is the child psychiatric inpatient model um, in which um, we work very carefully with a variety of child oriented clinicians and providers in a consultation approach with a heavy emphasis on case conferencing and case learning to transfer the skills that the staff at these particular facilities are interested and equipped uh, to adopt themselves. Next slide, please. 
So this experience over this last nearly two and a half decades has le have led Dr. James uh, Jay Shore and myself to develop develop a six stage developmental model for planning, implementing, and sustaining rural telepsychiatry. And our experience is is that although it arose in the context of telepsychiatry, it is not necessarily constrained by uh, this set of experiences, and that the planning, implementation and maintenance processes are widely shared among all different kinds of services. So these six stages include needs identification, followed by infrastructure survey, attention to partnership organization, to careful consideration of the structure, structural configuration of the services, to pilot implementation, and ultimately to the solidification and sustainability of these services. Let me turn now to each of these stages and turn and speak briefly to some of the major tasks that are, have arisen for us. And I believe uh, will po be posed for anybody developing such programs in American Alaska Native communities specifically, as well as rural uh, communities broadly. Next slide, please. The first is in terms of need identification. Some of these tasks may seem self-evident, but our experience suggests that despite that apparent uh, uh, evidence, uh, they are anything but self-evident in most people's experience. And then it's one of the first um, major tasks is to be clear in identifying the prospective service population. Who are the individuals in need? What is the nature of their need? What are the services required to address that need? Where are those um, resources and services located? How can those resources and services be mobilized? And ultimately, how can we integrate that within uh, an overall comprehensive uh, continuum of care? It is the one of the most critical first steps uh, in appreciating the targeting of telepsychiatry and telemedicine services generally uh, to the needs of a local community. The next step after that is being careful and deliberate in determining what the unmet healthcare needs are, and especially in the context of the local priorities. Now, we as healthcare providers and, org and or healthcare organizations may have our own sense of what the local priorities ought to be based upon evidence um, that we uh, have assembled, but pursuing those priorities in the absence of understanding, appreciating, and cultivating the perspectives and the um, expectations of our local community partners uh, is a recipe for disaster if one does not do so. The next major task in this particular stage is considering the optimal alignments between available telehealth technologies and the ability to address these needs. As other presenters, and I'm sure discussants will um, speak to during our time together over these three days, we're often enamored with sophisticated technologies and move to them, in our experience, too frequently without careful consideration of the lowest common denominator between the technologies that are available that can adequately meet the apparent needs of the of population that we propose to serve. And that often fairly rudimentary kinds of telemedicine technologies can meet these needs quite effectively. And indeed, if we in fact move to more sophisticated technologies, we begin to risk um, all the vulnerabilities of the local capacity, the experience with such technologies, patient adoption of them and comfort with them. And then lastly, the major step here in terms of needs identification from our perspective is assessing provider, organization, and community readiness to adopt and support these kinds of approaches. All too often in our experience, and particularly in the early days um, of our efforts, we, did, we discovered that we did not pay close attention to readiness and levels of preparation at each of these different tiers in terms of patients, providers, organizations, and communities. And that lack of, of attention to readiness, which can be assessed relatively quickly and in um, important and meaningful ways, uh, has critical importance for the next steps that one proposes in taking to develop such a program. Next slide, please. 
stage two is an infrastructure is a survey of the actual infrastructure. This it too is quite evident in assessing the technological capacity locally in terms of broadband internet connectivity, cellular coverage, imaging technology, and the available and critical peripherals uh, related to the services that they're intended to support. Determining access to technical support staff and training opportunities. We talk about the digital divide, but the digital divide also often camouflages the fact that the availability of high speed internet um, may be uh, I I existing locally, but unless we have the local capacity in terms of technical support to sustain and to address the inevitable problems uh, that are often arise in terms of connectivity, it will um, program our efforts for failure. We very carefully inventory the existing services um, to best integrate and use the resources available locally to bridge the gaps in care in between organizations. One of the major challenges we've identified is the uh, assumption for the most part that these services can remain apart and stand alone. They do not do so effectively and certainly not to benefit and service of the needs of patients. And then lastly, uh, clarifying the financial resources and the human capital of available not only to implement, but to sustain these efforts. Next slide, please. The third stage has to do with careful attention to the partnership organization and understanding and appreciating and determining ultimately the optimal mix of the partners of the participant organizations and identifying the options for program structure that will ultimately be located within this organizational landscape, whether these uh, particular program structures and services stand alone or a hybrid or an integrated care model depend very much upon the nature, extent, and the collaborative nature of these kinds of organizational partners. Again, importantly, assessing the organizational capacity to support the program options and critically to convene and reconvene frequently leadership from these organizations and key stakeholders so that everybody has an opportunity uh, to have a voice in the planning, implementation, evaluation, sustainability, and future direction and expansion of these kinds of services. And then ultimately confirming the commitments to coordinate care among the participating organizations themselves, recognizing that standalone services are not necessarily likely to be sustainable and the most effective approach uh, to take. Next slide, please. Stage four has to do with this understanding the structural configuration of these services and careful, careful work around delineating the roles and responsibilities of the inter interested parties. One of the frequent lessons we learned that lack of clarity about this led to boundary violations, to uh, unfounded assumptions uh, about the participation responsibilities of the various uh, participants. Establishing an oversight body responsible for monitoring continuity and the quality of care and recognizing that this oversight body needs to have representation of the full range of organizational partners more than just a given organization that has primary responsibility for delivering the care. Crafting very specific protocols in written form about uh, standard procedures for operation and the, or these organizational roles and sharing these draft protocols to elicit input from participating organizations and individuals and doing so on a regular basis that enhances common understanding. Uh, and then ultimately reaffirming the financing, the resource contributions and shared decision-making processes uh, that often underpin the success or failure of these particular endeavors. Next slide, please. Stage five for us was in pilot implementation. All too often we find that in fact, um, be driven by enthusiasm and, and, and aspiration, many particular services move quickly to broad expansion and dissemination. We believe in starting small and starting from success in designing and implementing a startup or a pilot period that has clear goals and performance metrics from which we can build to larger and more successful uh, initiatives. 
and to solicit throughout this entire process patient, staff, and partner feedback and incorporate that feedback into a continuous quality improvement process. And to assess performance processes and outcomes, which I'll return to in a few moments, and ultimately to identify and carry out these revised procedures. Stage six then has to do with solidification and sustainability, which is our next slide, please. We've now, at this particular point, based upon our understanding, the insights acquired through our pilot implementation efforts formally launched, launched the clinical service with broad uh, dissemination. We identify key stakeholders. We support the emergence of local champions. They may be patients, they may be family members, they may be providers themselves who can endorse and advocate for the program. And we remain vigilant in regard to the opportunities to finance care, uh, reimbursement to improve technical capabilities and to support research on clinical and cost outcomes to justify continued and expanded programming. Next slide, please. Some of the administrative lessons that emerged and that um, were inescapable for, for based upon our experience is that multi-system partnerships are absolutely essential. They are key and must include the right partners. How do you determine the right partners? It's through stages one and two and the subsequent stages and keeping them on board in uh, continuous interaction with one another. Understanding and assessing repeatedly the organizational climate and culture of these organizational partners and that the organizational culture and climate often varies importantly across likely partners and that there are historical precedents and past interactions that can dramatically affect the readiness to collaborate regardless of individual organizational readiness or the technologic uh, capacity of the broader system of care. Uh, green ab about how to brand and consistently message these services is essential as well. And ultimately, major uh, fatal flaw in our experience was a lack of attention to jurisdictional issues um, that we had not anticipated. Next slide, please. Some of the recommendations we would advance uh, under the rubric of research, research challenges are as follows. We believe it's important to invest in understanding uh, how to enhance our indicators of patient status and function within the context of social and cultural dynamics. That, in fact, social and cultural circumstances very much affect our understanding of patient status and functioning and that we need to pay greater attention to establishing the reliability and validity of the clinical care that we deliver by the range of different modalities. Third, that we understand the differential preferences among patients and providers for type of treatment modality by condition. So that, for example, in the context of telepsychiatry, we know that the uh, internalizing disorders, for example, such as depression, are more resistant uh, to um, certain forms of um, telemedicine uh, interventions than, for example, substance use disorders and post-traumatic stress disorder. And how do we move beyond patient-centric treatment outcomes to document cost-benefit, cost-effectiveness, and return on investment? We believe that these are essential questions for us uh, to be able to answer and to be able to translate into meaningful use in terms that not only our constituents and stakeholders can appreciate, but that our funders and, pos and policy ma uh, makers can embrace. Next slide, please. Continuing this is how do we frame and operationalize the organizational research that captures the key elements that are critical and underpin the coordination of continuity of care? How do we illum illuminate the effects of financing options, fi licensure, credentialing, and oversight policies on not just the services themselves, but the organizational partnerships that are so critical? How do we examine incentivized implementation of integrated telemedicine-specific models to affect system-level changes? And lastly, how do we document the multi-level factors that affect diffusion, adoption and the uptake of telemedicine itself. Last slide, please. We can plan all we want, strategize in advance, uh, and pursue these kinds of efforts in practice. But ultimately, there's no doubt in our minds that experience is the ultimate teacher. And that, as this particular slide reminds us, 
look, they're not all kittens as cute as they may be. And for those of you who may have difficulty seeing this, these are baby skunks as opposed to baby kittens. So last slide, please. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to share uh, our experiences, the organizational program provider and patient lessons that have emerged from our work over the last two and a half decades. And hopefully that will um, pose um, some major um, uh, questions in your mind about areas for future inquiry and that deserve our attention in order to maximize the benefit for our patients and working together as providers and organizations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hanson. Hanson. That was a wonderful, that was a wonderful presentation. And yes, now we'll hear from our panel chair, Mary Wakefield, to moderate a brief discussion. Um, and Dr. Wakefield, we're running a little late. Let's see, it's mm -hmm. 1240. We had planned 10 minutes, so let's go till 1250. Yes, thanks, Kate. Um, I'm not too concerned about the time because I know we've got a little bit of elasticity at the end of a, uh, the next panel. And Dr. Manson, we started a little bit late this morning, so no reflection on your remarks. Um, uh, you just was a fantastic overview. Thank you so much. A thorough, thoughtful, uh, and um, and really comprehensive in a very short time. So can't thank you enough for that overview. Exactly what um, knowing you for decades uh, from a distance, I, I would expect. So appreciate all of that. Let me just go ahead and, and ask you a quick question. And then I want to invite my panel colleagues uh, to either comment uh, uh, or raise a question as well. So for my panelist colleagues, just a, a heads up, I won't call on you with any kind of a raised hand function. There aren't very many of us. So please feel free to just jump in if and as you have a question or an observation for Dr. Manson. Uh, if we're stepping over each other, I'm sure somebody will back up uh, for a second. So um, Dr. Manson, you mentioned at the top of your remarks and you came back to it again a little bit later in, your re in the research agenda. Uh, you mentioned the need from your vantage point to focus on cultural context and social context. And so I'd like to ask you to step back for a second and just think about that, if you would, that therapeutic telehealth uh, utilization in provider to provider communication. Is there anything else that you might um, uh, uh, prescribe for us to look at, think about in terms of gaps in, in uh, uh, what's known or isn't known about uh, cultural context, social context, that, that you think could or should be embedded in, lifted up in that provider to provider communication dyad uh, through telehealth. I've uh, been thinking a little bit more about this as we're coming into this uh, um, uh, three-day workshop today. Uh, that is that, uh, that real focus on, on uh, social determinants of health, health and equities, and, and, and how that plays out in provider to provider communication um, uh, and I just would be interested to see if you've got an additional thought or two uh, based on all of the work that you've done. And then, as I said, after your comments, I'll uh, open the floor to my panelist colleagues uh, for any comments or questions they have. Thanks. Well, thank you, Dr. Wakefield, for your kind remarks. Um, the first thing I want to underscore is the centricity we often, uh, the, the centricity trap that we often fall into. So when we talk about provider to provider dyads, we often think in terms of one particular type, type of provider and another type of provider. I, su I submit that in fact, providers represent and reflect the culture and climate of the organizations of which we're a part. And that these organizations uh, can have quite different cultures and climates. So that for example, um, physicians working with psychiatric social workers in our experience, have very, very different kinds of assumptions about the nature of the focal um, point, that is the patient with whom they're both concerned with. Um, and so here, I think of a discipline as a culture and that there are different log logics, different languages, different areas of emphasis, different approaches that providers from different disciplines um, act in terms of and that we don't appreciate frequently those disciplinary differences as matters of cultural differences. Nor do we appreciate, for example, if you're in the Indian Health Service or the Veterans Administration trying to work with one another, the major differences culturally between those organizations. So the, the natural um, default is to think of social and cultural differences as between 
patients and providers or between individual dyads and providers. And while critically important, and I tried to emphasize some of the ways in which status and function um, may vary socially and culturally and, and need to be taken into account, I want to emphasize the fact that uh, social and cultural um, uh, factors emerge at all of these different levels and that we have to be thoughtful, uh, proactive, and anticipate the ways in which those factors may emerge and affect the nature of our relationships. These are all discoverable, uh, but they take time. They take um, a proactive sense of inquiry. Um, and I, but I am impressed that we can discover them and we can build on them. And in fact, that process of discovery itself um, encourages a sense of alliance among all of the participants uh, in this particular therapeutic process. Uh, terrific. Thank you. Um, let me open the floor to the, um, as I mentioned, to my colleagues from the panel to see if any of them have questions or, or observations for you. Mary, I'd like to ask a question. Please, Becky. Um, well, first, Dr. Manson, thank you. That was that was so informative. And um, one of the questions we've been asked to answer is um, what is the uptake of different types of provider to provider telehealth? And what I'm wondering, given the broad array of programs you described, is to what extent is provider to provider telehealth formalized in such a way that we could actually quanti quantify uptake versus more informal interactions that frankly will just be hard for us to capture. Well, thank you, Dr. Slipkin. Um, that excellent question. One of the slides and I had a, and I assume the slides will be available to the panelists as well as to the participants has a reference at the bottom that I indicated about our own attempts to understand the factors uh, facilitating or impeding uptake at the level of patient providers, programs, and organizations. And, um, and this is ultimately one of the great questions. So it's, we often begin in the provider to provider arena through consultation liaison models, um, but it, it, and those often, are quite successful to the extent that they occur within a bounded universe of, of interests and concerns that are shared between the providers in service of their uh, common patient. Um, but uh, th there are other aspects uh, related to uptake that um, affect the provider's um, relationship and their collaboration. And it has to do with the constraints or the possibilities that are introduced by the organizations of which they're a part and the extent to which those organizations are willing to, and we've come to call it a, a little bit of uh, uh, risk management and uh, risk uh, venture, uh, that they're willing to you know, push the boundaries uh, ultimately in small ways um, and that uh, enable a sense of creativity and innovativeness at the local level. But it has to be fairly well controlled so that all of the participants um, uh, are operating in a relatively low to moderate threat environment. And uh, that means that, in fact, that provider to provider relationship ultimately depends very much upon the kind of upper level administrative support and management and encouragement and protection, if you will, uh, that they receive from their supervisors or those who control the programs that they're a part of. And again, from our point of view, this is a matter of readiness. Uh, and if you have two different organizations that are at very different levels of readiness, uh, then that is very likely to compromise that provider to provider relationship and their willingness to um, push those boundaries that we believe are so closely related to uptake and further dissemination. Thank you. Other questions from colleagues on the panel? Dr. Manson, I'll ask you a question from one of the audience attendees then, and um, uh, I'll just go straight to that. A question for you is, how do you measure impact if your program is based in a local community? So that's the focus. And then secondly, 
how do you measure um, or how would you recommend measuring changes in practice? Any thoughts about those two questions? Yes, thank you, Mary, and whomever from the audience uh, submitted that question. Uh, it's a very thoughtful question. Um, first off is we think that um, impact is multi-level. It's not just in terms of patient outcomes or clinical outcomes, although that's absolutely essential um, and is a necessary, but from our point of view, not sufficient condition in terms of our focus on impact. We have to look at as well the extent to which as a function of the, that success, it diffuses out to others and ripples across the social networks of members of these communities mm -hmm. so that it encourages them to participate as their need arises uh, or the need of their significant or others arise uh, in terms of reinforcing the importance and the possibilities of telemedicine for them. Secondly, there's no greater, we're talking champions, we're talking local champions from my point of view. And it's not just patients and family members who are local champions, but it's providers. You get a provider who uh, is uh, successful, uh, can articulate the ways in which her or his uh, efforts uh, clinically are advanced in service of patient care. Um, they become a, a, a critical champion and they then touch uh, their fellow uh, providers within the community as well as outside. And so we have this rippling and cascading effect that we're trying to promote uh, across these different levels. The same is true at the level of program and organizations. And that's why we start small and we try to get initial traction and uh, even small um, indications of success that we can build from and use those who are part of that success to continue to advocate uh, across the spectrum of their um, relative levels of, of commitment as well as representation in the community. Um, and the last thing, Mary, I'd like to underscore, when we talk about the social and cultural context, um, yeah. we need to think really broadly. My remarks, I hope people won't think them as being just simply specific to American Indian Alaska Native people. Just, just a quick question, these, these are really broadly um, to all of us, because we all as human beings are cultural beings look at the uh, and the organizations that we're a part of are cultural or uh, have major climate and cultural aspects. So I think our experience generalizes broadly. Thanks for that uh, additional comment, uh, uh, Dr. Manson. And also just to make your illustrate your point, one of the questions or observations coming in happened to re reference the Amish community. So uh, 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 just underscoring uh, the differences by uh, by various communities, regions of the country, and so on. Um, are there any other quick questions from the panelists? Otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and draw this session to close uh, and pass it back over to Kate Winsack. But any other quick questions or comments from the panelists? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, Dr. Manson, this is Val Murray. We go way back. How are you? I'm I just fine. wanted to also say to you that this was an incredible, incredible presentation. And what you suggest is that it takes a lot of time to cultivate this setting or context for telehealth, uh, health, health service delivery in situations where time is of essence. So talk to me a little bit about that. I know this, we have to, a very short period of time, but it takes a long time to do the things that you do in order to be able to do this well. Well, if I may, Velma, thank you. It's great to see you and thank you for your question. You know, we talk about um, so much of the work that we do in, in these kinds of communities, whether it be native or not, rural or not, as moving at the speed of trust. And so I think the first major challenge we we have is establishing trust, not broadly, but with one or two key stakeholders who then become the local champions that one can uh, acknowledge that we are authentic and credible, not only in intent, but in action, and that we were going to be there for the long term and that uh, we are similarly invested, although not an immediate part of the community, 
we wish to support that community. And I believe that's why we start small and look for early success is so that we can demonstrate uh, that we can develop these trusting relationships and build from them. So I believe it's all relational and which is a, uh, that's why we have the opening phrase uh, of greeting in tribal communities, all my family. And so we're looking to establish that sense of cohesion and connectedness. With that, thank you very much. I'm going to pass it back to Kate Winsek, who I think is going to take us to a break and uh, for about 10 minutes, and then we'll be coming right back for a stakeholder panel. Um, so again, Dr. Manson, many thanks to you. Uh, Kate. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Manson, and, and to the speakers before you. Uh, so let's take a quick 10 minute break. We'll come back at um, 105. Um, you should see the countdown clock on the screen in just a minute. That'll help you remember when to come back. Um, and just so we ask you to return on time and so that we can start with our stakeholder panel at 105. Thanks, everyone. See you soon. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're going to get started. Uh, good afternoon. We will begin uh, this afternoon with our stakeholder panel uh, who will provide a three pronged approach or perspective on rural telehealth from the policy, healthcare delivery and research perspective. Um, the panel will be moderated by Brock Slayback, Chief Operations Officer at the National Rural Health Association. And panel members include Krista Drobak from the Alliance for Connected Care and Teve Morostra from Harvard Medical School. So, Mr. Slayback, please begin. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, uh, depending on where you are in the country. It's a pleasure to be with you today on this esteemed um, topic of telehealth. It's always a pleasure to uh, share the virtual stage with uh, folks like Dr. Wakefield and Tom Morris from F4HP. And I just want to um, say that uh, NRHA has long been involved in telehealth issues uh, going back even before the pandemic when this has become quite popular. I'm going to do a quick introduction and overview, and then in turn, Dr. Mahotra and um, Krista Drobak will be giving a short presentation as an introduction to our afternoon of conversation. Um, from my point of view, I would say that rural Americans face significant barriers that have limited their access to health care, including geographic distances, lack of public transportation, and then, of course, the workforce shortages that have uh, been longstanding in rural communities. We have the Present with the reality of 138 rural hospitals having closed since 2010. Uh, these hospital operations um, have ceased to exist. And one of the things that I will point out in terms of rural hospital closures is that once the hospital closes, and over the last couple of decades, we've seen the intense um, activity of hospitals employing their physician nurse practitioner and physician assistant workforce. So once the hospital leaves the community, then of course the access to these primary care points of service also will be leaving. We know that some of the 
disparities are higher in rural communities. Uh, Tom Morris addressed some of those earlier in his presentation. But we know that rural communities tend to have more people unemployed, lower incomes, with approximately as much as 25% covered by Medicaid. And in addition to this, providing health coverage, uh, Medicaid provides a, a growing portion of the populations now through Medicaid expansion um, made possible through the Affordable Care Act. So in this void comes telehealth, um, and it has always been, even before the pandemic, uh, an important advocacy element for the National Rural Health Association. Uh, we have always understood this to be an important element to how we can extend the services being provided to rural Americans. And Dr. Mahotra will, will discuss more intensely some of the growth in these telehealth services in rural communities. Uh, but we know that this can reduce important variables like travel time, uh, particularly those in very remote areas that could be very problematic. However, we see, and it has been mentioned, broadband, reliable uh, internet services are certainly problematic and ob obviously something that is being addressed through many of the pandemic relief pieces of legislation that we've seen passed in Congress and being implemented now through the Biden administration. Um, we are also looking at uh, many of the variables that uh, uh, my policy changes that have created some of these um, uh, recent ad increases in the public in the uh, use of telehealth services. So, for example, uh, the many many 1135 waivers that have been implemented uh, to be able to afford greater access to telehealth in rural communities has certainly uh, been uh, pr been productive. Um, when I talk to providers around the country, I will say that all of them are very much in favor of these services continuing much like they have through the pandemic through 1135 waivers. And that are very concerned, they're very concerned though post pandemic about the reality of this continuing um, into um, um, the era after the, we finish, hope, to finish the pandemic. So what we're looking at is when the pandemic health emergency, the, the public health emergency is over, uh, we are seeing a lot of 1135 waivers that will be uh, uh, ending as well. And this could really stymie a lot of the growth that has happened um, in rural uh, applications of telehealth services, including provider to provider service. But what I find when I talk to rural providers and when I talk to them in terms of the importance of telehealth, several key factors come uh, through very clearly. First of all, as has been mentioned, it increases access to care, particularly those that, uh, for those populations who are homebound or perhaps uh, may, and many have transportation issues. It also has important access to services from home uh, this can provide a huge relief to many of those, especially those that aren't uh, able or willing to get out uh, because of the uh, COVID, uh, the chances of contracting COVID. And then you have those that are trying to balance work and raising families with accessing care. This can be an important element as well in terms of the social influences of this, um, of this programming. Technology is an important issue that I hear talked about quite frequently. These are issues like the broadband that I talked about a second ago, but also the telehealth platforms. What are we using uh, in terms of the uh, technology to produce these telehealth services? And then, of course, uh, these can be very large uh, barriers to implementation. Telehealth is well suited for many types of care, and many of those have been enunciated throughout the course of uh, the, today's presentation so far. But we know that chronic care management, pay, patient education to maybe new diseases that they've contracted can be very important, important uh, elements. 
And then, of course, as Dr. Manson finished uh, talking about earlier, one on one counseling and mental health uh, services have been a very popular uh, way in which to use telehealth services. And then, of course, substance use disorder um, of using telehealth to expand the ability to provide medically assisted treatment to patients uh, in rural and remote areas. And not surprising and hinted to already um, in this presentation today, many of my colleagues in rural hospitals and clinics around the country want to see the reimbursements that uh, have been created, incentives that have been created. They want to see those continue. And those are certainly uh, something that we're working on to make sure that the platforms for, re, uh, for these telehealth services will continue into the future after uh, the public health emergency actually um, expires. So this is a little context for the operational dynamics of what our hospitals and rural communities are facing, what clinics uh, and physicians, nurse practitioners and physician assistants are looking at when they're trying to uh, navigate the complexities of this uh, of this of this pro of these programs. So for and I'll just close by saying the complexities are around the reimbursement elements, and I've talked about that a little bit. But I want to go on to say that beyond Medicare, which is of course a major payer for many of the services in rural communities, uh, Medicaid can be confusing as it varies from state to state, and then of course many states have different policies and payment procedures regarding commercial insurances uh, and their coverage for telehealth services. And so these are some of the problems that I hear constantly uh, when I talk to rural providers about uh, using this technology. And now it's my pleasure to welcome to the uh, virtual stage, uh, Krista Doback, who will uh, do a presentation on, uh, uh, from her perspective on provider to provider telehealth services in rural communities. Thank you, Brock. It's a pleasure working with you and your organization on behalf of telehealth. Um, I am Krista Drobak, very happy to be here, thank you. Um, I am a, the Executive Director of the Alliance for Connected Care. We are an advocacy organization. We've been around about eight years and unlike the ATA, we don't set standards or um, hold an annual meeting, we ex focus exclusively on advocacy. So let me give you my disclosures. Um, next slide, please. Um, these are our members. We have a mix of health systems, employers, vendors, um, technology providers. So we like to think that if we can find consensus across this diverse group that um, we've, we've got pretty good policy. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, um, these are our advisory board members. We try very hard and um, welcome lots of collaboration with patient groups, um, provider groups, and it really does take a village to implement, pass and implement uh, telehealth policy. So we, um, so we collaborate across the spectrum. Um, if you go to the next slide. So I focused in on the provider to provider consultations, but um, let me just give you, since we haven't really had too much of a discussion about the state of play with telemedicine as it pertains to patient access, I'll just give you a quick update. Um, in 2020, Congress passed legislation that gave CMS the ability to provide flexibility to providers um, around payment, reimbursement and payment in Medicare. And in our estimation, Medicare is a critical uh, part of achieving the vision of the future where telehealth fits um, into the care spectrum without sort of a, a second thought. Um, without Medicare reimbursement, many providers are uh, unlikely to adopt telemedicine as a regular part of their practice. If you have a patient panel that's only 30% um, commercial, uh, commercial pay, pay, patients, excuse me, you're unlikely to change your workflow to accommodate telehealth. And of course, you don't probably are unlikely to tell your patients that you're willing to do a video visit if you're not going to get paid for it. So Medicare reimbursement is a key part of 
of provider adoption of patient-facing telehealth services. Um, and Congress allowed CMS to make that happen. Um, previous to the pandemic, there were uh, there are significant limitations on reimbursement for telehealth in, in Medicare. Um, specifically, the patient has to be located in a rural area. The patient has to be in an institution um, in order to receive telehealth services, and those institutions are listed in statute. So you have to be in a doctor's office or a hospital um, or a rural health clinic, for example. What we're trying to achieve is a um, a situation where the patient can be anywhere, um, in their home, in their car, at their neighbor's house, um, and if something happens and they need to consult a provider, um, that they have that ability. So um, we are advocating on Capitol Hill right now for an extension of the flexibilities that Congress granted to CMS. And we are looking, uh, asking Congress for an extension until the end of 2023. Um, when the pandemic started, CMS added uh, a significant number of codes to the list of Part B codes that are permitted to have a telehealth modifier. So they, they dubbed them Category 3 codes. And we, uh, CMS has said that they will keep those Category 3 codes in place until the end of 2023, and basically said in their proposed physician fee schedule rule that they'd like to see evidence uh, that would convince them to keep these codes permanent. Um, it's permanent telehealth uh, use codes. So we're asking Congress to align with CMS and allow stakeholders to bring peer-reviewed published data forward uh, showing that, that telehealth and Medicare is good for taxpayers, good for patients, um, and, and good for health outcomes. So um, we are hopeful that Congress will pass that extension before the end of the year. Uh, we're not sure there are going to be a lot of congressional vehicles next year uh, to uh, to pass the extension. So um, we're just asking um, Congress to hook the policy on to the end of the PHE. So when the PHE expires, whatever length of time that is until the end of 2023, uh, the telehealth flexibilities would stay in place. So again, that is the patient-facing telehealth that we are um, that we, we we advocate significantly on. But I know today we're here to talk about provider-to-provider -provider consultations, and again, I'm going to focus in on the codes and payment because obviously. Payment is very important to whether or not um, providers actually take advantage of the ability to consult with each other. I think another important part is cross-state licensure, which I will address in, the, in a minute. So reimbursement. Provider-to-provider -provider consultations are not actually considered telehealth by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. They have specifically stated in the physician fee schedule in 2018 that that these consultations fall outside of the section of the Social Security Act that governs telehealth, which is 1834M. So they have the flexibility to uh, implement these consultations, to change them. Uh, they are not limited by the statute. In 2013, the RUC, um, the committee that values um, medical services for purposes of reimbursement, made recommendations to CMS and said, uh, said we need um, provider-to-provider -provider consultation codes, so interprofessional uh, consultation codes. And they made the arguments, they brought forward the, um, the analysis and, the, and the, um, the reimbursement levels, and CMS said, no, thank you. Uh, these are considered bundled services. This is so CMS basically said we think this is part of patient care, so we're not going to pay separately for it. So over time, fast forward to 2018, so five years later, CMS, in an effort to keep up with the way that medicine was changing and to appropriately reflect the value of medical care that may be outside of what was already being reimbursed, they reconsidered the policy around provider-to-provider -provider consultation reimbursement. They basically said this is, we are going to reimburse for provider consultations because we think that it contributes to payment accuracy 
for the way that primary care and chronic disease management is practiced. They did not focus in as much on emergency medicine and consulting with a specialist in emergency medicine, but I know, and as Ativ is gonna talk about, uh, there is a lot of use case for telestroke and other types of consultations in an emergency setting. Um, but CMS really looked at this when they first started reimbursing for these codes as a chronic disease management tool, as a way to facilitate um, more team-based care, more integrated care, more patient-centered care. So if you look at these codes, uh, they're not very much. <laughs> um, so the first five codes can only be reimbursed by physicians. The sixth code can also be uh, billed by nurse practitioners and physician's assistants. And um, they can be billed for either a new or an established patient. Um, they, the, there are a couple limitations for program integrity purposes. The consulting provider can't have seen the patient in the last 14 days. So it's not really a follow-up situation. It's more like you go and you see your, your um, primary care provider and there is a consultation between primary care and specialist, but the patient never sees the specialist. And in fact, if the specialist sees the patient 14 days prior to the consultation, or if the patient is referred to the uh, physician, um, there can't be any billing. So there, let me get into a few of the burdensome aspects of this, which would lead maybe to some recommendations about how payment could change to facilitate more provider to provider consultations. So these numbers are not very high. Um, I should have put the actual numbers in here. So a 0.35 is about $18, um, 0.7 is $37. Um, 1.05 is 55, and then here we have $74. So if you think about it, you've got to, um, as I note here on the left-hand side, you have to actually um, do some um, work around these codes. So it's not just, you know, your, your fellow provider calls you up and asks you for some advice. You actually have to um, provide verbal like, consultation, and in some cases, you have to um, provide a, a written report. And rep providers have reported that this is somewhat burdensome. Uh, so if you look at 99451, you have to have spent 50% of your time in data review and analysis. That's, mo that's much more than a provider calling up and saying, these are this, these are, this is the patient's history and symptoms. It's, you have to actually be looking at their um, you know, diagnostic reports, et cetera. So there is somewhat of a high bar in terms of getting paid for this, and these payments are not very high. Um, the other thing is only having physicians bill for this is, can be, um, um, have, has been reported to be a barrier by physicians. And then the biggest barrier was patient consent. CMS required patient consent at least uh, for every bit, for every consultation, and um, primary care providers in particular um, noted that this was a high burden for them. So, in this particular fee schedule for the upcoming 2020, excuse me, 2021 year, or excuse me, 2022 year, CMS is proposing that you can get a blanket uh, consent for provider to provider consultations on your behalf. Um, every year. So once a year, you know, as a patient, you just agree that they can, um, that your provider can go and consult with other providers. So I'll stop there. Um, I know that Steve has got some great slides and um, hopefully can answer any, any questions that you might have in our um, question and answer period. Thank you. Well, thank you. Next up is uh, Dr. Ativ Mahatra, um, who will be sharing with us uh, the larger context of the telehealth experience in this, in, this, uh, in this area. Thanks so much, Brock. Thanks so much, Krista, for those comments um, and all of you for having me join in. The slides I have uh, before we get to the q and I I wanted to spend a few minutes uh, covering three topics. Uh, the first is the focus of this uh, three-day uh, uh, workshop is on 
provider to provider, but we all know that the provider to patient telehealth has really boomed during the pandemic. And I wanted to lay that context out. What do we know about that? Because I think there could be some nice lessons for us about provider to provider telehealth. Second, I'll go into a little bit more detail on one example of provider to provider telehealth and some uh, both strengths and pitfalls. And then I'll go back to where Krista was, which is a little bit about the payment system and how that really changes how uh these kinds of technologies are deployed so let me start with uh if we go to next slide uh and i have no disclosures and next slide after that so i think we're all aware that the use of provider to patient through either video or audio only telemedicine visits boom during the pandemic these are some data from medicare in terms of the number of telemedicine visits per week huge peak in april of 2020 and then a slow decline uh, subsequent to that next slide one of the things i wanted to emphasize is that you could get the impression that all providers are doing that and that is not the case we see in certain uh, clinical specialties, such as behavioral health, where the majority of visits are now provided via telemedicine. Um, this is data from December of 2020, but you see in other specialty areas, very little telehealth use or telemedicine use um, with provider to patient. I wanted to emphasize this because when we think about the deployment of these technologies, of telehealth into rural communities in some of these clinical areas, you just can't get away. It just um, just having the conversation between two providers or the provider and patient interacting isn't sufficient. You need testing. You need other equipment. You need the ability to do procedures. And how do we develop that infrastructure in the rural communities so that provider to provider telehealth can be deployed effectively um, and these other clinical areas can be impacted. Next slide. While so much of the focus in the policy debate has been about video uh, and audio only telemedicine visits, I do want to emphasize that other forms of telehealth have surged during the pandemic. Uh, Krista just gave the examples of what have been termed the e-consult codes, the provider to provider consult codes. We see an eightfold increase in those codes, use of those codes during the pandemic in the Medicare population. Though something we'll come back to later, they those build codes probably represent just the tip of the iceberg of actually how much is happening. We also see another form of uh, provider to provider telepsychiatry, and we see other forms of telehealth, such as remote patient monitoring. Next slide. Maybe one that gets uh, is the most common, but maybe gets the least attention is simple portal messages. Most of us uh, uh, in the audience have gone to their website or the app for their pr primary care provider and sent a message in just asking a simple question and having a response come back asynchronously later. These are some data from Epic where across 300 health systems that use that their software, they see a roughly 50% increase in portal messages during the pandemic. This is great for patients. This is a convenient way of getting some input on their healthcare problems. And also is a probably a pretty efficient way for providers to respond to those patients. But there are some downsides and something that we'll come back to that Krista really mentioned uh, just really briefly is how do you pay for this? Well, it's fine, but uh, for patients to get this care, providers are resp uh, responding with burnout. It's taking hours a day for them to answer all these portal messages and they're not getting paid for them. And how do we address that issue? Next slide. One of the issues, and I think this came up in some of the Q&A and chat features, is also the issue of disparities of care. Well, we're hope in this, and I think the underlying motivation for this is that the use, greater use of telehealth will increase uh, use among disadvantaged populations and narrow disparities. There is also the concern that this could be the exact opposite. And that is just really uh, emphasized uh, by some of the prior speakers that many disadvantaged groups don't have access to that technology. This is data from the Medicare population saying what fraction of Medicare beneficiaries had access to the necessary computer, smartphone, and broadband availability that they uh, need to do a video visit. And not surprisingly, people who are poor, less than 100% of the poverty line, roughly half did not, and it was much lower among wealthier Medicare beneficiaries. We see also important disparities by race and ethnicity, and as we'll come back to the rural urban divide here. Next slide. Um, so uh, 
in terms of actual use during the pandemic, we're seeing some interesting patterns. One thing that um, I think is really critical for this uh, uh, talk is and this workshop is that we're seeing substantial disparities between urban and rural residents in the use of telehealth uh, during the pandemic. Um, and if you go to the next slide, this is echoed in the Medicare population also. The last slide was the commercially insured. Among Medicare beneficiaries, uh, if you look on the right here, there is a almost 20 percentage point difference in the likelihood that a Medicare beneficiary in a rural community has had a telemedicine visit than compared to urban areas. And so how does this play out for both provider to provider as well as provider to patient telehealth will be something that's really important to emphasize. And I'd also like to note that this is the pattern that we're seeing here on the right is particularly surprising. Was prior to the pandemic, there was much greater use of telehealth in rural communities. And so during the pandemic, that has completely flipped. Next slide. I wanted to now turn to uh, one example of uh, provider to provider telehealth that illustrates both the potential and some pit pitfalls that we need to be aware of, and that's telestroke. Uh, next slide. Um, as uh, Joni Rudder and Tom Morris illustrated, we have known existing disparities between rural and urban communities um, in all form in many forms of health. This is just some examples in stroke care. Uh, on the right is the differences in mortality after a person has a stroke, and there is this uh, persistent gap between rural and urban residents, and if anything, that disparity is slightly increasing. That's very much related to what we see on the left, which is that over the last two decades, the treatment of stroke has really been transformed, and we have now started to use medications like Alteplase or other forms of trying to break up that clot that's causing the stroke, and there's increasing use in the United States of those technologies. The problem is, is that those technologies have not, uh, have, there's been higher uptake in urban communities. And while there has been growth in rural communities, if anything, that disparity is slightly uh, uh, getting larger over time. Next slide. So one of the hopes is that, and it was illustrated in the systematic review that uh, was, uh, that you've all read, is that potentially provider to provider telehealth could be the solution. In this particular case, it's called telestroke. A patient in a rural community might arrive at their emergency department having stroke symptoms. That emergency department may not have the, or often does not have the expertise to treat that uh, condition. So they pull out this fancy cart on the right and they use it with uh, to obtain the consultation of a neurologist who specializes in stroke care. The provider at the bedside and the provider who's on the video screen help do the uh, interview and the exam of the patient, and that remote provider can review the CT scan, the MRI, or any other imaging. It's an exciting way of potentially bringing that, uh, that expertise that's necessary for stroke care to those rural communities and narrowing those disparities. Next slide. In some work that was published earlier this year, they looked at what was the effect of having an emergency department with telestroke versus an emergency room, a matched uh, 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 emergency room that did not, and did patients get better care? Um, overall, the having telestroke did increase the likelihood that the patient would get that clot busting medication like Alteplase or other forms of reperfusion treatment. And there was a decrease in mortality, but maybe most specific and why I brought it up in this context was that the benefits of this provider to provider telemedicine was were greater in rural communities, um, which is in that first box, and then in the smallest hospitals. Not surprising, those are the hospitals were least likely to have that necessary technology early on, uh, but really illustrates the potential benefits of P2P telehealth. Next slide. But then the pitfalls. One of the things was uh, some earlier work found that almost a third of US hospitals have this technology of telestroke in their emergency department. The problem is that the hospitals that would benefit the most from this technology appear to be the least likely to have it. 
you see that rural hospitals had a substantially lower rate of having telestroke capacity, and the smallest hospitals were almost uh, half as likely as bigger hospitals to have that technology in their emergency department. A really critical gap. Next slide. So the question is why? And it really comes back to what Krista was describing, which is how the heck do we pay for this? Right now, an emergency department who has a patient with stroke, there is a payment that can be issued for telestroke consultations to the outside uh, consultant. However, that's not the way it works at these hospitals. They often compare, a small rural hospital often lacks the capital as well as the re, uh, expertise to implement that program. And the provider to provider consultation codes do not reimburse enough such that a hospital that only needs that service once or twice a year, it doesn't, you, you don't have enough money to actually effectively deploy that because there's so many fixed costs of having that fancy card and signing the contracts, et cetera. And I think this is gonna be a big issue in terms of how does provider to provider telehealth move forward. I also wanted to highlight some of the distortions that we need to be thoughtful of as we think about how to pay for this. First, there's a lot of administrative costs. Uh, Krista really highlighted, highlighted the burden. I gotta like comment and say, I got consent from the patient and I document that I spent more than 50% of my time reviewing records. All of those have costs and we need to be thoughtful of those costs because they could deter providers from using it and also increase costs in the US healthcare system. A related concern that we need to be thoughtful of is, is that you go to your primary care doctor, she orders, she does a provider to provider telehealth. You didn't even know about it, but then you get a bill because you have an out of pocket cost for that care. And how do we address that where patients may be frustrated and there may be a backlash like I didn't ask for that and why am I getting, why am I paying for it? And how does it lay out in terms of incentives for providers, how often they use this kind of Care. There's been a lot of interest in saying maybe that's the wrong way to encourage provider to provider telehealth. And really, what we need to do is give a hospital, a rural telehealth a provider, just a bundled payment or a capitated payment, and say, You take care of care, you take care of your patients as you see fit, and you don't have to build these individual codes. Medicare is really pushing forward with a number of pilot programs to pay hospitals and rural communities in that manner. And the, again, the advantages are it gives the providers the flexibility in how to use provider to provider telehealth. But the disadvantages are really the complexities and the design and the deployment. And we really haven't seen as much traction in this area as we might've wished. So with that, I think I'll wrap up and we can turn to a uh, next slide. Uh, uh, Oh, yes, I apologize. I realized there was two more things I wanted to make a quick comment on uh, in terms of research moving forward. The first question is, is that uh, on the left here, I wanted to emphasize, I get asked a lot by policymakers, what's the data on provider to provider telehealth? And as illustrated by the systematic review, we all know that that's, that's an impossible question to answer, just as we would be impossible to answer the question of do drugs work? which condition, which patient, which type of telehealth, and then really we can answer. And you saw in the systematic review all the outcomes that mattered upon the application. And that's gonna be really key for us to be thinking moving forward that there is no single outcome that we can look at. The second point I wanted to emphasize is that I've talked a little bit about the generations of telehealth research. And where are we in terms of this, where do we need to go? The first generation of telehealth research, I would argue, has been just demonstrating that this can actually be done. This is feasible. Really important to emphasize, in particular with new technologies. Then there has been a sea of studies that have looked at mostly provider to patient telehealth, which have randomized patients to, say, video visits versus in person visits and demonstrated that the efficacy seems to be equal. And those are, uh, Really where I think we need next in the next generation of work is really asking the question of now that we have that technology, what does it take? What happens if we layer on this form of telehealth onto in-person care versus 
uh, the existing in-person care? And does it really improve outcomes as opposed to showing equivalency? And that's really where I think we need to focus. And that leads to I, now my last slide, which is the uh, next slide, is a couple of ideas in terms of um, key recommendations. One thing we have to be cognizant of, there are lots of different P2P models and how do we uh, use those and how do we uh, use those in combination. I hope I've emphasized the importance of the financial sustainability of these models and that needs to be a key, key part of the research. Uh, simply showing its efficacy is insufficient. And also related to that point, as we see greater deployment of these new payment models, how will that affect how provider to provider telehealth is used? So with that, I'll stop and I think we can turn to some questions. Well, thank you, Ativ. That was an excellent overview and Krista, that was fantastic in terms of your presentation. I wanna kind of pivot on what Ativ uh, ended on and that is provider to provider telehealth services are not generally paid for. The fee for service model is, is perhaps somewhat uh, not as effective as it could be. Does provider to provider telehealth fit better in the value-based care models and discussing a little bit, picking up on what Ati was talking about and, and, and from your point of view on uh, the answer to that question. Absolutely. I mean, telehealth in all aspects, either whether it's um, patient facing or prov provider to provider is better in a value-based model. Uh, there's correct incentives on all sides in value-based models. The problem is that we're still built on a fee-for-service chassis, and unless we pay for things in fee-for-service, um, you know, the, we're not building value-based care around them. So uh, I would love to move off of fee-for-service, but it's here to stay. So I think that thinking about fee-for-service payment is important if we want more provider-to-provider -provider, um, consultation. Um, one other thing that I will say that I didn't is there is some evidence that providers don't have a big enough network to um, draw on, that there aren't, there aren't providers that are willing to do these kinds of consultations and that also these providers may not know each other. So that was something I forgot to mention as well as using um, provider consultations across state lines. Um, we there are most states do allow for consultations that are only provider to provider and don't involve the patient, but the licensure um, issues do prevent, um, you know, patient treatment. So if there was ever have to be a next step on a, um, you know, a specialty consultation, for example, that couldn't happen across state lines. So I know that was not answering your question, but those are two things I forgot to mention. Oh, that's good. So, do you know what do you do you know of any examples um, nationwide of where value-based purchasing models were paying for or at least allowed for the use of these technologies within that model, and, and was it successful? Like the comprehensive primary care. Plus oh, I was model. just going to say CPC plus. <laughs> I was just okay. going to say CPC plus. I mean the the I. I Okay, so CPC Plus gave providers a management fee to take care of a patient comprehensively. So the provider could spend the money based on what they thought would be, it contribute to the best outcomes for their patients. And the CPC Plus model, the last time I looked at it, the results were fairly mixed. Um, and I don't know that you can draw out specifically the provider to provider consultations as part of that because this, the CPC plus management fee was invested in all kinds of things um, and not just these kinds of consultations. Um, so I think the jury is still out on that, but maybe Ativ has more to say here. Yeah, Ativ, any follow up on that? No, I, the only thing I'd emphasize is that uh, we do sometimes often get focused on the payment and the fee for service payment. I, I would just emphasize, I gave the example of Telestroke and I said roughly a third, maybe now more and some new data saying almost half of hospitals in the US have that technology. What fraction of them bill for it? A teeny sliver. They are using 
their overhead dollars and other ways of defraying those costs um, in terms of labor costs, um, ability to stay open, their expertise. So it's interesting to think about how, what are those most effective models? But I just did want to emphasize that in P2P, provider to provider, often it's not being billed for. Providers are just doing it on their own. Oh, interesting. Well, thank you. So, Ati, I, I'm really interested in um, the behavior and approaches that would make for a successful telehealth, uh, provider to provider telehealth consultation. Um, it, 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 the definitions of that and how that's being formulated. Yeah, no, so uh, we, you know, one of the themes that'll probably come up on these three days is what is provider to provider communication or telehealth? Um, and there are many, there are several forms of those. One of those is e consult, the codes that Krista had reviewed. And I, I think, it, you know, um, we did a project that I think illustrates this um, in many safety net systems, urban safety net systems. They have mandated that all specialty consultations must start with an e-consult. So if you want a question, you got to write a paragraph up and have the specialist review that. And it, uh, we did some recent work um, with uh, folks in Los Angeles, DHS, the large, second largest safety net system in the country, about what impact it has. And the work really highlighted some real strengths and amazing benefits of P2P. But also some potential issues as we think about the behavioral response and where we move forward. You know, I think it just illustrates that when you make a transformation of how care is going to be provided, it's going to create new problems. So the primary care doctors who are now using P2P mandated on them found that it really improved their access of their patients to specialty care and access. They were some of their patients were waiting a year to see a specialist. It was a horrible system in that way. And also was a great educational tool for the providers as they learned from the specialists and felt more empowered to care for more complex issues. But I wanted the point that I wanted to emphasize for this conversation were some of the downsides and how the, it created new problems. Um, the, the people had to now communicate via text. You ask me a question, I respond. I'm a nice guy, you're a nice person, but we never got training in this. And so there was a lot of friction. People were like, that specialist reviewer is so rude, doesn't understand, is blocking my patients from getting the consultations they want. And there was a lot of resentment from the, some primary care providers in that they're like, I'm not your medical student. You're supposed to do this work. Why are you making me do all these things? And so it's just interesting, not that those problems are not solvable, but really cognizant that as we implement these new systems, there's going to have to be new issues that arise that also need to be addressed and really that importance of iterative design. Well, thank you, Atib. And for the last question, before we go back to Dr. Wakefield to moderate the session, the rest of the session with all of the attendees. Um, and so to you first, Krista, what sort of research should HHS uh, be funding that would help inform how best to leverage provider to provider telehealth, because I think this is an important foundation. So, Krista first, and then I'll keep, please. I would actually say that we need qualitative research to determine what would increase a provider's use of consultation tools, um, because I, I think I don't have any data to back this up, but I think there is agreement that being able to um, consult another provider is valuable. Um, the reluctance to use these codes, uh, there's a story behind it, and I think that HHS can get to the bottom of it and make changes through levers that they already have um, to increase participation. Uh, and I'm I'm saying participation in the codes, but obviously that translates to more. Um, provider to provider consultation. Okay, up to you. Well, Brock, I'm going to do. I'm going to twist this around and ask you a question, which okay. is that there's a uh, a lot of this is focused on rural health and provider to provider communication. Do you think, with your expertise, it needs to be the studies need to be done only in the rural context, or how much can we take the lessons from urban and suburban areas and apply them to the rural context? It, you know, as we think about new research in this area. Well, that's a interesting twist. I I would say that there are, there are comparables, but 
one of the areas that I see that's really important in the rural context is looking at professional isolation and how we can, uh, you know, productivity and all of the relative uh, um, and issues that come to that. But for the professional isolation, you got rural providers that are dealing with uh, systems and issues that they're not familiar with, and I think. Um, it's a little bit different than, than in the urban context, but I think there are a lot of analogs that would certainly be useful um, in understanding it better in the rural sense. Absolutely. Thank you. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to um, Dr. Wakefield uh, for the moderation of the attendee questions. Brock, thank you very much. Uh, and Atif, Krista, thank many thanks to both of you for an incredibly informative uh, set of presentations from all of you. Uh, I have one question I'd like to ask. It might be a little bit more in Atif in your area, but uh, um, but please, any of you uh, might wish to respond. Then I want to turn to my fellow panelists and ask them, invite them. If they've got a question, they should feel free to jump in. And I'll also be watching the chat box for any questions from our attendees. So we've got a few minutes uh, if people want to use it for uh, questions and comments. And I'll just jump in with the first one. Ativ, I, I, I think I understood this correctly. You were talking a little bit about uh, the the changes in um, uh, utilization of telehealth during the pandemic and uh, um, associated with the patient population. I believe I, I heard you suggest that we don't have data on pro, on potential changes in a telehealth consultation between providers and provi provider to provider. That is, has it increased uh, during the pandemic, remains status quo, has it decreased for some reason? I could envision a trajectory and I could envision rationale behind that trajectory uh, as I think about provider to provider consultation during the pandemic. But my underlying question is, A, is it true? Is it the case we don't have that data? And B, would it be useful to have that sort of data? I'm thinking now, not just of, uh, during this pandemic, but also, for example, of regional, uh, uh, take regional disasters uh, and uh, uh, communities that might be in fact impacted by um, uh, um, weather-related uh, disasters. Uh, um, Katrina, uh, as an example, where you've got um, Im impacted healthcare provider systems for periods of time in rural areas, urban as well. And then how does this infrastructure come into play? Uh, is it lessened? Is it increased? Does it add value? How do we know? Um, it, so, so my broader question is, is this information that would be useful to have just thinking about public health emergencies, uh, local to national disasters and public health emergencies? Uh, would it be useful to have that uh, uh, background and also to link it then to what difference it makes in terms of, of uh, care for populations that are adversely impacted by those emergencies. So I hope that that question was clear. It's pivoting off of a couple of comments that you made. I'll stop there and see if it was and invite others to respond as well. And then, as I said, panelists, you're up next if you've got questions. Atif? Right. Well, Mary, I think you raised a two, uh, I'll uh, focus on two of you, the uh, components. The first is, is that so much of the focus right now is going to be on routine times and how provider to provider communication can help. But I think you raise a really important point as illustrated by what we've all lived through for the last two, 18 months is that in the setting of an emergency, having the infrastructure, having this technology around can really be a lifesaver. And you raised hurricanes, pandemics, and other things. We saw this big surge because there was a need. And as we think about the benefits of this technology, that can be a really important one. The second one was really how much provider to provider telehealth is actually happening. It's a real problem we don't know. I can tell you, because that's what I do all day, is I can look in Medicare claims and Medicaid claims and commercial claims and tell you how many times a certain code was billed. And I can I highlighted that there was eightfold increase in the e-consult codes. The big problem with those results that I shared with you is that they are, as I emphasize, the tip of the iceberg. And we know that the vast majority of that care is not being billed. And so without that, we really lack that data. And just to emphasize that point, 
clearly there is a real need to understand how much of this technology is being used by providers in the nation because we don't really have a gold standard. Great. Any other observations sort of related to this topic, Brock or Krista, before I turn to my colleagues? Anything else you'd want to add in? Um, nope. I think Steve said it well. I'll just I'll just add, and I and it and it occurred to me um, throughout this that there are a lot of provider to provider consultations that occur that are not known. So I know the doctors at my hospital when I was a rural hospital administrator in Mississippi would often get on the phone and or or have whatever the method was and they would consult with a surgeon or a urologist or an OBGYN and they'd spend 10, 15 minutes on the phone and then they would proceed to go back and treat the patient. So we don't really know what's being done in a professional context that is just not getting recorded. And I think a team uh, mentioned that in his formal remarks, which I think is really important to see how much that's going on without us knowing a lot about it. Yeah, a great comment. Thank you. Um, so colleagues on the panel, are, do you have any questions or observations you'd like to share uh, with this group? Mary, this is Joanne Conroy. I do have a, two questions if I could. Please. Um, uh, thank you for a great presentation. I'm CEO of Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. We actually have a really large connected care center, but we work on a subscription model. So a TIF, yes, that would never really show up in any billing um, because the insurers aren't billed. But one of our questions that we have to answer is, what's the impact of provider to provider telehealth on payers? And I realize there's not a lot of information out there on the impact of payers, or, or if there is information, it's not published. So how would you suggest actually teasing that out? Um, if you think about it broadly, there should be some total cost of care benchmark that you can follow with the introduction of provider to provider or even provider to patient use of greater use of telehealth. But what are your thoughts on that? Maybe I'll just jump in as sort of my cup of tea. You know, certainly what we would need and ideally have is a set of rural providers who were provided, uh, say, uh, provider to provider, let's say specialty services. And we would set, see how much of that was used. But the key thing that you're raising, Joanne, is, is that what would be the impact on other kinds of consultations? And so there, it can go both ways. And, and I don't know, I don't want to judge which way is better or not. But if that uses more provider to provider communication using telehealth deters in person consultations. And when there has been some evidence that that's the case, at least in some urban safety net systems, then from a payer perspective, increasing use of this kind of communication could both be beneficial to patients, but decrease costs because those in person consultations and the associated testing procedures, et cetera, would be deterred. We don't know if that's going to actually happen and there needs to be research on that, but that would be the kind of ideal way that I would uh, want to kind of focus on that. And then obviously in line with just the spending aspect would also want to know what is the clinical impact of that. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I want to go back for just a second uh, to achieve your question earlier of Brock and um, uh, pull in a, an observation from the chat. And that is to, to achieve to your question, rural providers, uh, an observation was this, rural providers have a broader scope of practice and often have to deal with a range of challenging issues versus their urban provider counterparts. A uh, range of challenging issues in which the opportunity to refer out is not uh, as easy an option always as it might be in an urban or a suburban area. And another key difference could be the integration that is more at play in more populated areas, in integration of health systems and, and healthcare providers uh, working um, uh, uh, it, uh, in a more coordinated ongoing fashion. So a, question, a related question or observation might be as a, pr a primary care provider in an urban integrated 
delivery system more able to use and deploy provider to provider communication than an independent uh, um, primary care provider might uh, uh, be able to do in, uh, without those kinds of affiliations that you might see more commonly in an urban area. So not sure if, if anybody wants to respond to that, but did just want to uh, use that as an extension uh, in addition to Brock's good comments uh, in response to your question. Are there other questions from uh, panelists at this point? Uh, but Mary, if I could just really quickly just oh, emphasize that point. Um, uh, it's much easier for a big health system to implement this within their health system. They can inc make the specialists do these consultations. And I think you really raise an important point. Lori Usher Pines, who I think is speaking tomorrow, um, will, has done some really interesting work working with community health centers that are independent how do they deploy telehealth it's a very different dynamic great yeah great helpful to hear that too thank you um so my panel colleagues uh, any other questions or observations from you before i pull a couple of more comments from the chat uh mary i i do have a follow-up question um Please, becky brock you mentioned uh workforce and I feel like there were threads of workforce in everybody's presentation. And I'm wondering if um, people have a view of the relative importance of the reimbursement versus the networking and the relationships. Um, I'm just thinking about the fact that in like like the comment you just mentioned, Mary, in small rural areas might be a lot less likely to be in a healthcare system, also might be a lot less likely to be in an accountable care organization. And if reimbursement for the consultant goes up, is that independently gonna solve the problem or do we need to focus on, on creating these relationships? I think it's it really has to be the trifecta. I mean, you have to pay for it, you have to have the network, and you have to have the inst aligned incentives that would prompt you to reach out to one of your um, you know fellow providers rather than just tell the patient to go to a specialist. So we really need all three. I don't think payment alone uh, fixes the problem because. You have to have the incentives aligned and you have to know who you would want to consult, you know, so it really has to be all three in, in my estimation. I, I would agree. My, my experience has been that patient care is a relationship business and um, doctors and, and nurse practitioners and physicians and assistants talk to other providers of like type. And they um, understand and appreciate the value that they bring to the equation. But then I also know that when you get into the finance office of the facility or to the healthcare system, this has got to be viable and sustainable in, from a monetary point of view. So, um, so I, I think that this is um, an important element to understand the, the social part to this process is, is really important really uh, very, a very high factor in the, in the, in the consideration. And could I just follow up and ask, given our charge as a panel, um, do you all see specific research questions that need to be answered on the workforce front? I, I think the parts that I would really emphasize is that beyond the clinical impact on patients is really, um, is this likely to encourage providers to move to rural communities as well as does it increase retention of providers in rural communities? Um, you hear the story of uh, was, we were doing a project on community mental health centers and the psychiatrist would come into town, would work for a year or two, and then it's be like, I don't, I just don't like practicing here. Some of it is cultural, some of it's different, but some of it's just feeling so isolated that they, you know, you train in this big hospital, you got a specialist for every single little thing, and then you go there and you feel like, oh, I can't take this. And so if you have that form of quote support, is that gonna increase retention? We don't know, uh, maybe others know in terms of specific research that's demonstrated that, but I think that that would be, at least for, I don't know of any, I think that would be an important question. 
Great, thanks. So Mary, this is Velma. Uh, this was absolutely fantastic presentations to both of, of the speakers. Um, I was intrigued by um, the the speaker that uh, I S Ativ, who talked about the broadness of telehealth, and that we need to give greater attention to some really fundamental questions. Uh, and it made me wonder your thoughts about are do we have evidence to demonstrate that provider to provider telehealth medicine is improving outcomes for patients in rural communities? Uh, my view is that we do not have that evidence um, and that that evidence would probably come in a number of a cumulative way. And just to maybe cl uh, clarify my comment, I don't think we'll ever have one project that will assess that. We'll find to build off some of the prior presentations in the area of treatment of behavioral health, we see it helps, but then we need another project in another clinical area. That's kind of annoying. I think we'd all love to develop this research base quickly, but that's the nature of medicine. And we, you know, it's gonna matter upon the different applications to see where it has the greatest benefit. It's almost like then we're at a point where as you said earlier, we need more research to help us understand what condition, healthcare position, condition, which patient, and what type of telehealth is needed in order to address the the issue of rural uh, telemedicine. Yeah, I mean, this is one then one of the challenges that we've had as advocates for changing telehealth policies, there's just not a lot of data yet that has been peer reviewed and published. And we, I mean, the, the pandemic has given us the opportunity to really look further into what telehealth could mean for the healthcare system, but we just haven't had the time yet to, to really um, understand its full impact. And, and then that includes workforce issues. I really love the uh, R RCT design that you proposed to begin to tease out some of the issues that we're talking about now, which then suggests the, the need for more randomized control projects that are funded in order to help us understand more about how to do this better. Great, other, thanks Phil. Are there other questions or observations from the panelists? Mary, Maybe this is questions? Joanne Conroy again. Sure. Um, uh, real quickly, you know, we deliver subscription services to 38 rural hospitals. We find that those hospitals that have advanced practitioners or PAs actually use the provider to provider system far more than those um, that are staffed by um, MDs or DOs. Is what do you think about um, investigating um, the utilization or acceptance or the barriers? according to um, kind of your um, level of training and or um, a scope of practice? That's a really interesting question, uh, Joanne. Uh, by the way, I was able to visit your Dartmouth Center. It was really fun to see many of those consultations happening in real time. Um, and it's an interesting observation about the type of provider. I guess the first easy point is that when we think about the rural providers, uh, it's, it's quite striking to see what a large fraction of those providers are not physicians. And it, that rate is growing much faster in rural communities than urban communities. And so I think it's an important point that under, there is just a difference in the workforce um, and what form of training they have. That's an, I don't know of any data to see whether um, there is differential uptake, but it, I think it would be an interesting question given that larger fact that nurse practitioners are playing in such a key role in the rural communities. Thanks, Jayeshra, did you wanna step in with a question? And we're getting, getting pretty close to time on this session. So I'm gonna turn yes. to you and, and uh, if somebody else has something burning, we'll take it. Otherwise, uh, we'll be coming into a break after this, but Jayeshra, take as much time as you wish, of course. Thank you, Mary. 
uh, thanks, Krista and Ati for great presentations and uh, Brock for great, uh, you know, conversations about follow up questions. Uh, my question is really related to, you know, the communication, the telehealth provider to provider communication design. Are there are there any standardization about it? Is it like a combination of asynchronous and synchronous styles or is there is it going to be something just verbal or is it a combination of verbal and written? Uh, so I was just wondering if there is any research in that uh, or evidence in that uh, area. That is the first question. And the second question is, do you have any information or evidence about telepharmacy service models? Uh, because I'm from the University of Nebraska Medical Center and there they have a subscription type of model, which is the hub and spoke model where they're providing this telepharmacy services to, uh, you know, different rural hospitals who cannot afford uh, or rather they have pharmacy provider shortages. So two questions is one is the design of the telehealth provider to provider uh, communication itself. Is there any standardization? And second is any experiences you all can share about uh, the telepharmacy services? First part, uh, Jayshree, the, um, the, I think it's in, um, in terms of the design, one thing that, and maybe this will come back to is, what the heck are we talking about with provider to provider communication? There are lots of different forms. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked about echo. We've talked about e consults. We've talked about just picking up the phone and calling the surgeon. Um, yes. I will note that the systems that I'm aware of that I've done research with that have deployed e consult systems. I told you about the Los Angeles one, but many others have done mm -hmm. that on a text basis asynchronous okay. so that the provider would go to a platform. Ask the mm -hmm. question, send a paragraph in, and then the specialist will respond, and then they'll be back and forth with exchanges as many as necessary to address the problem. That has been set up because it's just so much easier logistically, right? Trying to yes. find, you know, everyone is so busy and trying to get someone on the phone at the right moment is so difficult. I will emphasize that one of the things that we have heard repeatedly, and this is mm -hmm. for all of us who've dealt with technology to a much greater degree in the last year. There's all these yes. technological barriers. There's, it's really clunky. It's not integrated into the EMR. And so that is another issue that comes up in terms of just how to make this user friendly so that people have it. Because right now it's often, I have to go to some random website to fill out my e-consult. Um, so I just wanted to comment that I don't know anything about the pharmacy aspect and I don't know if others want to jump in on that one. Yeah, if I understand, Thank you, Ati. Thanks. If I understand the question on the telepharmacy, I mean, it's always been one of my thoughts as a rural hospital administrator that when the business case is made for a specific service, it's an easy mm -hmm. thing to operate. So I use radiology as an example, teleradiology. Okay. Um, it's been a wonderful application in the rural context because you can transfer film for overreads very easily using uh, the the telehealth process. Telepharmacy fits directly into that model as well. Um, so when you integrate that technology with the PAC systems, which release the medications upon order review, and you're providing mm -hmm. that oversight in terms of care for the patient, um, it really is a nice uh, integration of technology yeah. along with the uh, with, with the patient uh, safety that's in, built into that system. And it can be done 24 seven and it's uh, really a, 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 when it works, it works really well and I've seen it, I used it. So it was a great, uh, it's a great process. Yeah, thanks for sharing Brock. And thanks Ati for the, uh, for your comments. Thanks, Jayashree. Um, I'll end with just the last question from the attendees uh, um, or from our audience uh, for you, and then I'll hand it back over to, to Kate. A question about whether or not any of you envision a role for a P2P multidisciplinary engagement and uh, discussion. So, um, and I would just add to that, uh, you know, when you start thinking about addressing issues like social determinants of health that cut across uh, sectors uh, beyond healthcare, you know, one might maybe could see something out there and in, in that space, but uh, that wasn't part of the attendees question. So I'll keep it. Uh, I'll just restate it and focus it again. And do you envision a role for P2P multidisciplinary discussions at, going forward? Is there space for that? What would it look like? So you know, research I think, be done there. Yeah, I highlighted um, that. I'm a primary care doc. I have a patient who has a complex issue with rheumatology and endocrinology and the surgeon. 
And one of my jobs is to coordinate care. It's really painful to coordinate care because you got to get each of those three providers on the phone. And then as soon as you hang up with one of them, you got to call the other one back and everyone's busy in clinic. Having platforms that allow for there to be communication across all four providers who are managing a patient could be very beneficial. I don't know of any research that has set up such a platform, um, but that was something that I think uh, merits investigation. I don't know, Brock or uh, um, Krista, have you heard of anything specific to that? I've actually seen it used uh, in post acute care, particularly around swing beds and being able to use that multidisciplinary approach, looking at social determinants, trying to move the patient across a continuum and getting that care accelerated. Um, that can be very, very helpful um, in the in the post acute care space as well. So, in full disclosure, I am on the advisory board for a company called Picasso MD. They are, it is run by um, Dr. Reza Sinai, who's a cardiologist, and they have a platform that connects specialists with primary care providers in real time. They call them curbside consults. So, this was started because Dr. Sinai was receiving text messages from primary care providers who were saying, I have a patient in my office, blood pressure is this, you know, EKG says that, do I need to send them over to you or to the emergency room? And Dr. Sinai was finding that he was constantly having these text messages back and forth with primary care providers. So he set up an actual platform to do this. And so he's recruited, um, Special to specialists in different specialty areas, and then signs up uh, health insurers or provider um, offices to basically um, be part of this platform where they can do in real time um, consultation. So that's the only one I'm aware of. And again, disclosure, I'm on their advisory board, so I happen to believe in them. So yeah. one thing, Mary, if I could just interrupt on that, that just one quick point, I know we're trying to wrap up, but Krista's comment really emphasized for me that it could be easy to think that provider to provider telehealth can only be offered by local providers. I'm in New Mexico and the New Mexico providers do it or in Colorado or whatever else. There are a big surge in various private telehealth companies that are trying to do this on a much more national scale. Krista mentioned one. There's another one that does e-consults specifically to rural providers called Rubicon MD. I don't know what's that right balancing act between so many of the issues and knowing what's going on in a local community versus these other companies that are providing things at much greater scale and potentially more efficiency. But I do think we should just be cognizant that there is, in terms of provider to provider communication, these many new companies that are emerging. Great notes to end on. Thanks for that ad as well. And thanks to all three of you for just a wonderful, robust discussion uh, and rich information sharing. Really appreciate being able to tap into the expertise of all three of you. I'm going to pass it over to Kate, who I think is going to take us to break. Kate? Yep, great. Thank you, Mary. And thank you uh, to our stakeholder panel. That just went really, really well. That was very interesting. So let's see, it's 2.20. We'll take about a 25 minute break now until 2.45. Um, so please watch the countdown clock on the screen for the time to return. Um, and then after the break, we will jump into our first key question and hear the first and hear from two speakers and also the first results from the evidence review. So we'll talk to you all in about 25 minutes. Thank you. Hey everyone, welcome back. We're going to get started again. Uh, for the remaining time we have today, we will cover key question one. So we have four key questions for this workshop and we will cover the first one today. And that is, what is the uptake of different types of provider to provider telehealth in rural areas? So we will hear from Dr. Annette Totten, Dr. Kelly Withy, and Dr. Christine Dymek. Um, so all the presentations are completed, Dr. Wakefield will moderate the discussion session. And just a reminder for um, this discussion session, everyone is invited to send questions or comments through the Q&A pod as the presentations go forth. Remember to add the presenter's name who should address your question um, if it's just for one specific presenter. Um, and then remember just that the chat pod is just for um, technical questions. 
So let us begin. Dr. Annette Totten of the Pacific Northwest Evidence Based Practice Center will first present the evidence review findings for key question one. Go ahead, Great. Annette. Great, Kate. Thank you so much. Just checking to make sure everyone can hear me. So, as Kate said, I'm Annette Totten. I'm an associate professor at Oregon Health and Science University and a core investigator at the Pacific Northwest Evidence Based Practice Center. Um, in addition to the findings from the first key question, I'm going to give a quick overview of the methods um, and then summarize the results over the course of the next couple of days. If you could go to the next slide, please. My disclosures are that my team and I don't have any financial conflicts to disclose. However, we do need to make the point that we are responsible for the content of the report and these presentations, and that the work was funded through by NIH through an interagency agreement. If you could go to the next page, please. Just to acknowledge the team, these reviews take a lot of people, including research staff, but also some clinical input from two of our key investigators, um, Dr. Elder, who directs our Oregon Rural Practice-Based Research Network, and Dr. Swenson, who practices in rural Oregon and Klamath Falls. If you could go to the next slide, please. Um, there's also ARC and NIH people involved. You've met some of them. The ARC task order officers are listed here, and then the Office for Disease Prevention. If you could go to the next slide. So, as um, described, the purpose of this review, so we'll quickly describe the purpose and some definitions, some of which has been covered, so I can skip pretty quickly, um, and then get on to the key questions. So, next slide. So, the purpose of this review is broad. Um, often systematic reviews focus only on effectiveness. This one also includes use and implementation and methodological questions as well. Um, and the main reason that this per review was undertaken was to inform this workshop. So it's very exciting to finally be here after talking about it for several months. Um, the, I do want to remind everyone that a systematic review is limited to published or publicly available data. And that's one of the challenges we'll talk about more. We know that there's a lot going on in telehealth right now, um, but some of what we have is descriptive, not evaluation. And then a lot of probably what's going on is not either published or available. And that's one of the challenges we'll be dealing with. Next slide, please. Um, the background you've already heard about, you don't need to know more about this other than, as we all know, that access is one issue related to health disparities, but there may be several others, and that will come up as we start to um, talk about the limitations of the research and what we can and can't conclude. And then, as the point has been made, um, We've been talking about telehealth for a long time. I've been doing systematic reviews on telehealth for seven or eight years now. And the overriding comment is why isn't it happening faster? The pandemic gave us a huge boost, um, but now we're in this trajectory where we're not really sure what's going to happen, um, both in the research and in the policy and implementation of telehealth. So it will be very interesting to watch that over the next few months. If you could go to the next slide, please. Well, we've talked about definitions in this workshop. I want to make sure that the definitions for the review are clear. So we used a very broad definition of telehealth, and that is that it could be use of technology to facilitate communication either across distance, location, but also across time so that means it could be synchronous or asynchronous. We were um, broad in terms of the modes we would accept, video, text messaging, um, lots of different, and as well as the functions. We Some other people have mentioned that there are e-consults, there are real-time consults, there's education, there's mentoring, as well as what clinical area or clinical use. So the telehealth um, P2P, includes everything from mental health to remote surgery, theoretically. Um, provider to provider, just to clarify, that is what we're focusing on in this review. And we also defined providers broadly in that we accepted any um, professional provider. So the one exception, and we'll repeat this again, is we did not include family providers. So a clinician taught, having a telehealth visit with a family caregiver would not be considered provider to provider telehealth. 
And we did not impose a definition of rural. We um, took whatever, however it was defined in the research studies we were able to locate. So if you could go to the next slide. So the key question we're focusing on is this first one, which I said is not a traditional comparative effectiveness question, but is a question about the uptake. If you could go to the next slide. So before we dive into that, I'm going to very quickly provide an overview of the methods that we use. The methods are um, documented in excruciating detail in the report and the appendix, and that report is now public and we'll show you how you can look at that at the end and make comments. Um, so the goal of the methods is to both lay out and then adhere to standardized approaches so that we can make sure the review is comprehensive, transparent, and then as reproducible as possible. If you go to the next slide, one of the tools we use are different ways to outline the questions and put parameters on them. One is just a visual representation of the connections to the questions. And so this is our analytic framework. If you go to the next slide, Another framework we use um, specifically to try to lay out what's included and excluded is referred to as the PICOS format. And PICOS stands for Population Intervention Comparator Outcomes and Settings. And so I'm going to just quickly show you um, some key elements of the PICOS framework. And so the population we already said is rural, any age. Um, the population, the patients in the pop patient population, sorry, needed to be rural, too many Ps, but the providers could be located anywhere. Clinicians were broadly defined as well as payers. So basically we ex excluded things that were exclusively urban or we couldn't tell, or as I said, interactions between informal um, providers and clinicians. Next slide. The interventions are what we defined, provider to provider telehealth. So we were not including patient visits, virtual visits. We were not including remote patient monitoring where data is transmitted to a clinician, but there isn't any clinician to clinician interaction. And then if there was a clinician interaction that only involved referring to services, but no ongoing discussion or collaboration on diagnosis management or prevention, we would not include those. You could go to the next slide. The comparators is most relevant for tomorrow for the comparative effectiveness. Um, so we'll talk more about that tomorrow, but just to give you the complete framework, we basically took any comparator that was either no telehealth to telehealth or different types of telehealth. Um, the outcomes vary by key question. And so for this key question, the outcomes that are important is any indicators of uptake or use of telehealth, rates of use, time to implement, or characteristics of users we were looking for. We did not include the results of surveys of attitudes that were hypothetical. So for example, so every now and then someone will do a study that says, would you use telehealth if it's available? So if it did not involve actual experience, we did not include it. If you could go to the next slide. So we also specified designs, dates of publications and healthcare settings before we start. In this review, we're also broad in these areas. So the designs we included trials and several types of observational studies. We did not include um, simulated data studies, descriptive studies with no evaluation component or non-systematic reviews or commentaries. We focused on what's been published in the last 10, 11 years, and we took basically all settings except mass casualty and battlefield care. If you could go to the next slide. So once you set all those parameters, you actually conduct the search. Our search was of four um, citation databases, Ovid, Sinal, and Bayes Cochrane. As I said, we searched from starting from January, 2010. We are currently updating the search. One of the things that happens in this process is that once a review is posted for public comment, which happened today, we will update the search through today. So we're currently in the process of updating the search and the final report will reflect everything we can find through today. The other sources of data, ARC posts a public request for data called the SEEDS 
And so we um, sometimes that gets published in the federal register. It gets distributed widely. We ask if anyone has any unpublished data. We search gray literature, which is unpublished data databases. And then we take suggestions from peer reviewers or technical expert panel members if they know of studies that we haven't identified, and then we see if they meet our criteria. And now we'll take suggestions from the public comment period as well. If you could go to the next slide. Next slide. Oh, no. Hello. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay, I was worried we froze. It's been working all day and it's like got to work through the end of this, right? So, um, basically, we triage the abstracts we identify and the full text of the articles following standards set by ARC. Basically, the key concept is dual review and we, um, we do that. So, if you could go to the next slide. So, very quickly. Our overall results is that this is, oops, sorry, go to the next slide. So just to quickly show you, this is in the report that we document how each study falls out or is included and which key question it's included for. It, um, we call this, this is a formally called a prisma diagram. Sorry, I meant go ahead to the next slide. Um, so the first question that we had about use, if you go to the next slide, it's kind of, a little bit sad to start with this question because this is the question with the smallest amount of evidence. We did not find, as other people have said, data that provides an overall picture of provider to provider telehealth in the rural United States. We did find some data on specific uses, so I'm going to share that with you now. If you could go to the next slide. So in emergency care, we found two surveys where um, emergency rooms or departments were surveyed about whether they use telehealth for in 2014 in New England, predominantly rural areas use telehealth, but still really low numbers. Common uses were stroke trauma in pediatrics and psychiatry, and they that survey documented that the places that were more likely to use it had no neurology coverage. Uh, a national survey of over 900 EDs basically found at that point in 2016, 46% of rural EDs were not using telehealth at all. And this was lowest in the southern states. If you could go to the next slide. Another area where you see this research reported is in psychiatry. Similarly, services, surveys of emergency departments using psychiatric consults higher in rural areas and in waves of mental health service organization surveys. Um, additionally documented that it was more likely that telehealth was being used in rural and underserved areas and increasing everywhere over time. If you could go to the next slide. Stroke, as was mentioned, is one of the areas where telehealth has been um, growing for quite some time. We did find one study based on claims where it compared 2018 to 2015, looking at all the stroke hospitalizations and whether telehealth was indicated that it was used in that care and that the changes all went up, but, uh, but in the rural areas went from, you know, 0.6 per thousand to 8.6, it's a pretty large increase. And this study also broke areas out into super rural, the ones on the bottom of the quartile. If you could go to the next slide. And the final area where we found one study was in pharmacy where state health officials were interviewed about whether they were using pharmacy systems. Though this is somewhat dated, you'll see it's 2010 and there was not a lot of use at that time and partially due to state regulations, which changes were pending when the survey was done. If you could go to the next slide. So basically a couple quick caveats and then I'll wrap things up. So if you could go to the next slide. Um, just, I always have to say this is telehealth and rural are broad terms and indexing and descriptions are not as precise as we'd like. That's why we ask people to refer studies and we do a lot of hunting outside of citation databases as well. The data definitely in this topic is limited by lack of coding or billing, which are often a source of data for utilization and we don't seem to have that. We do have these handful of studies. I'm hoping one of our four other speakers will start publishing some more data on what's been happening during the pandemic. Um, one of the issues we'll talk about more as the time goes on is the diversity across rural settings and that rural, 
rural is not the same everywhere. And that's something that definitely starts to come out when you look at some of the national surveys. And then for this, we really don't have a lot of the pandemic data available yet. You go to a next, the next slide and skip to the last one. So in summary, on the very limited data we have from regional and national surveys, we telehealth for provider to provide a communication is being used across several clinical indications, and it is increasing even before COVID. And that's about as much as we can say right now, if you'd go to the final slide. So this is the, the report was posted today at Effective Healthcare. .arc.gov. Um, if you just Google effective healthcare, you'll hit it. And we are hoping to have both public comments and revisions based on what we hear at this workshop. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Totten, for your presentation. Uh, next, we'll hear from Dr. Kelly Withy, who will discuss Pacific Provider to Provider Telehealth. Welcome, Dr. Withy. Thank you, and good morning. It's morning here in Hawaii. So I'm gonna speak a little bit about rural areas, but you folks have heard a lot of what I'm gonna say already. And so I really appreciate that uh, warm up for me. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. Uh, I unfortunately have no um, large pockets of money coming towards me from any great funders. So um, no disclosures to declare, go ahead. So I'm gonna talk about Hawaii and the broader Pacific. So Hawaii, as you can see, is a series of islands. Now, we used to have a ferry that went from Honolulu to Maui. It was wonderful. It was here for a couple of years and we don't have it anymore. So the only way to get between these islands is by air travel. Um, as you know, air travel is time consuming and expensive and is nowadays dangerous. Uh, so, we need to use a lot more telehealth than other areas. However, we were not a leader in telehealth uh, and, and still are not a leader in telehealth. Um, I would say probably Alaska has one of the better, definitely better system than ours for a very rural area, um, but we need to get better. And so I'm gonna tell you what we have uh, and um, there's much that we don't have. Go ahead to the next. So as you already heard, ECHO is a wonderful uh, resource for providers all over the place. Um, I really like ECHO because not only do you get education with it, but you also get connection to other providers. You get less isolation. Uh, you get uh, savings, hopefully for uh, patients uh, having to travel as in our state. Um, and that's what we're trying to assess. We do not have a good evaluation on that dollar amount saved. Um, but we do have indications that we have saved patients travel. So I'm a big fan of ECHO for provider training, but that is a set time that isn't necessarily ideal when you have the patient on site. Go ahead. So one of the things we do have available, and we've had it since 2012, is Telestroke. So Telestroke um, has done very well in Hawaii and um, as you can see, we've had uh, 490 consultations, 318 patients, and of those, about 40% received some um, TPA. And uh, you can see the survival rates there are very good. Only 5% passed away, 44% were independent at the time of hospital discharge. So this is pretty good compared to general numbers of um, 10 to 30% dying and 35 to 70% disabled. Um, so we can also say of the 490 telestroke consultations, 70% uh, or so were able to remain in their local hospital and not have to fly to our urban core. So that is really beneficial in my mind. Next. This is the hospitals where the telestroke program is ongoing. Um, we have funded it to continue on. And so um, I would say this is one of our first really successful evidence-based programs in Hawaii. Go ahead. What else are we doing next? This started three years ago, the coordinated care model in psychiatry. 
It's at our largest hospital, and it is uh, four psychiatrists who are part-time, um, largely retired, and come back to work for this. There are three full-time LCSWs, and they have two social work assistants and two social work interns. So this is done for a uh, physician, um, a clinically integrated physician network, and it meets they estimate 80% of the needs of the 15 PCPs that are involved with this. Uh, next slide. It's used for many purposes, but they've done some analysis. Now, all analysis stopped when COVID took over, because as I said, this is our largest hospital, so things change. Um, but this is as of early 2021, no, sorry, early 2020. And you can see that the PHQ-9, which is a measure of depression, decreased 5.6, and the GAD-7, which is a measure of anxiety, decreased 4. Um, this was in the set of the 122 patients that they monitored, and they got more than half the patients into remission. So uh, that's a good outcome. Now, the funding for this was grants so that the psychiatrists that I told you about were largely uh, the grant funded and volunteer, and then the social workers and the social work team were paid by the clinically integrated physician network. So this is not a funded model. This is a desirable model that was funded as a pilot. It is still ongoing, um, but we don't have any recent data from it. Next. Uh, this is a community health center on the smallest island there, you can see where all the colors originate from. And they are very ingenious because this is an island of 2,000 people, actually a privately owned island uh, that has one health center, one small critical access hospital, and one other healthcare facility. So they have, uh, and it's largely, the health center is largely a non-physician non clinician model with a physician uh, part-time oversight. And so they have gone many places to get their specialty care. And their model is that the provider on the ground with the patient sit in the room with the camera and discuss the case with the consult, the consulting physician. So this is a provider to provider model, but it also includes the patient in the discussion. And that way the provider learns, the on the ground provider learns things and the patient learns things and gets the care. Of course, this is more time intensive for the providers on the receiving end or providing the consults than other types of care. Um, but it's working very well for this small island. And you can see they've gone to many places. I tried to put pretty little colored mm, arrows, um, but a lot of the care they get from the main island of Oahu, some they get from Maui, and some they get from California. So they've been very ingenious with this, and they've combined provider to provider with provider to patient. So exciting what they're doing. Um, and they seem to be very happy with it and the patients seem to be very happy, um, but I don't have statistics on that. Next. Okay, so now we'll go more rural. And as you can see, this area here, if you look in the pink, those are US territories or protectorates. And you can see that they spanned larger, an area larger than the continental United States. Um, the red dots are not the islands. Those are just the markers for the islands. The islands are the little gray dots there. So um, this is where we really need telehealth. Unfortunately, we do not have good cables to all the islands. We don't have good internet. We don't have a lot of satellites that cover the area. So this is really a developing area, um, but one greatly in need of telehealth and consults from provider to provider. Next, please. So the areas circled in red are either territories or commonwealths. Uh, so they go on the US model of care, they go on um, Medicare, they get Medicare payments, they have requirements that are standard for the United States. The blue areas are protectorates. So they were important in World War II and they were trust territories. Now they have signed a compact of free association with the United States. And so they are independent countries, they are developing, and they get some support from us for um, 
health and education, and we have some military presence there. They get free migration into the United States, um, but uh, they have a lot of challenges. Um, they do not have to bill insurance. In fact, most of the countries don't have insurance or they are self-insured for their population. Uh, they do not have the same licensure requirements we have. They do their own licensing. They have large percentages of veterans per population. Um, each of these countries are small, but they all have at least a thousand veterans there, but there are no VA facilities there. So that is a reason to have telehealth. And the time differences are big. It is tomorrow there, and it's probably 3 a.m. their time right now, tomorrow. And then uh, the gross domestic product is interesting. If you go to the next slide, I'll show you what I mean. Uh, there, you can see their populations there, um, small countries. So uh, in uh, the Federated States of Micronesia is the first column that was fairly central there. There's 100,000 people, 1% uh, are veterans, about, um, and you can see their infant mortality is very high in comparison. Their uh, GDP is less than 4,000 compared to our 62,000, that's uh, very significant. And then their per capita health spend is very low. Um, so these are very rural areas, developing countries, but they are part of the U.S. Go ahead to the next slide, please. Since the 1990s, we've had a partnership, well, they've had a partnership between providers there and our Tripler Army Medical Center in Hawaii. Uh, it is kind of a hit and miss a partnership because you have to know somebody. And it's kind of like if you, uh, it's, it's email based. I'm trusting it is HIPAA compliant email based, um, but if you send somebody an interesting case, they will want it here in Honolulu. Uh, so I'm hoping, I don't know what percent get answered. I hope they all get answered, the inquiries, um, but a significant number of patients get transferred for care at the Tripler Army Medical Center. Um, so it's, well known that it exists, but does it work for every case? No, I would say it works mostly for the, the most exciting cases um, as they can be teaching cases here in Hawaii. Maybe I'm being pessimistic. Um, I know that everybody really appreciates it in the Pacific, um, but I think we can do more. Um, and so go ahead to the next slide. This is an interesting project. It was grant funded. It is grant funded. It ends next January. And a psychiatrist in Honolulu at the University of Hawaii Psychiatry Residency Program is licensed in the Federated States of Micronesia to provide care in one of the states of Micronesia called Koshrai. And, uh, but she doesn't provide direct care. She works with the providers there to do case-based video conferencing so that they learn and they get the care plan. Um, she does send a written case summary at the end and recommendations. Um, and there's been a lot of um, satisfaction with this and fear of it ending, but we do not have statistics yet on the effectiveness of it. Next slide. Uh, this is actually something I found when I was researching for this presentation. There is an organization um, in the UK called Swinfen that does free telehealth services um, direct to consumer actually that um, I did not know about. And two of the countries in this region have utilized these services. Now they probably have a lot of language barriers. So the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, uh, probably most people speak good, pretty good English. Um, but in Yap State, there's actually seven different official languages. And uh, so I would think care would have to go through the healthcare providers because healthcare providers uh, speak English and usually learn in English. And so um, this is a challenge that I'm not sure how they're doing uh, with Swifton, but, or Swinfin, excuse me. Um, but this is something that will probably pick up possibly across the Pacific as it is free. And um, they do offer the provider to provider consultation. Next slide, please. And there is an echo like gastroenterology um, um, telehealth service program there 
that is full of subject matter experts and they're from New Zealand, Australia, and they do regular cases with the providers in the Pacific. So this is coming along. Um, and then the next slide, next please. And then a similar thing for COVID specific, um, which is probably more popular right now, but with surges in COVID, well, actually I have to say these countries are mostly locked down. They've had very few COVID cases because they close their borders and turn the planes away, except for delivery boats. Um, so uh, interestingly, um, but some of the Pacific is not locked down. So you can see the surge in Fiji brought the COVID specific echo like activities to bear and uh, more than 100 providers typically connect for these sessions. It's Pacific wide. And so they've had very good response from the area. Next, please. In development, and uh, I was told to emphasize that, but these groups are all getting together. The Veterans Administration, who knows they need to provide services to their veterans in the uh, US protectorates. Uh, the military called Indo Indocom, oh, sorry, in oh, never mind. <laughs> the military here, um, the Pacific Island Health Officer Association, which is all the ministers of health, throughout the region, as well as the Pacific Basin Telehealth Resource Center, which serves the region well. They're all working on how they can maximize provider to provider consults, but it is in the planning stages. So what would I do if I had a magic wand? If you could go to the next slide, please. I would expand the volunteer networks for provider to provider telehealth for rural areas. So the Swifton type of services, um, but, Everybody likes to talk to people that are close to them in geography and an experience. So it may have to be a more local system. And in that area, it would be New Zealand, Australia, Hawaii, Japan, probably if there could be a network of folks from those areas who have ideas about the fairly unique um, virology and uh, especially insect-borne diseases there, as well as Hansen's disease, tuberculosis, um, as well as chronic diseases like obesity and diabetes and heart disease are very prevalent. Um, so it would be really nice if there were a local volunteer network, um, similar to what we heard in the last session, but um, those were commercial. Um, this would probably have to be grant funded or volunteer for the region that has very little money. And then if there were an inventory to create a directory where providers could figure out whom to ask these questions of, it would of course be great to be real time, but with the time differences, that's unlikely. So it would be, I'll have to be on a HIPAA compliant platform um, that would probably have to be standardized and accept by all, which is a challenge in itself. And then um, I would also encourage creating partnerships for direct telehealth, but I like the idea of having the local provider in the room to learn from, but also in this case, possibly to translate. So those would be my recommendations. And I believe the last slide is coming up. And there's my email for questions. So that's all I have. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Withy, for that presentation. And <clears throat> just so, as a reminder, we'll take questions at the end of this session. Um, so next, we'll hear from Dr. Christine Dymack with a presentation on provider-to-provider -provider telehealth adoption and sustainability. Go ahead, Dr. Dymack, and don't forget your video. Thank you. So hi, everyone. I'm Chris Dymack. I'm the Director of Digital Healthcare Research at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. I'm really pleased to be here with you today to share some thoughts about adoption and sustainability in the context of provider to provider telehealth. Next slide. So just reporting that I have nothing to disclose. Next slide. I'd like to begin by sharing some background information about the purpose of my presentation and the agency and the division that I represent. Then I'll do some context setting about key principles of technology adoption and since I'm a learner who needs examples to make abstract concepts real, I'll move to some provider to provider telehealth use cases to illustrate these technology adoption principles. These use cases are based on recent ARC research efforts. 
I'll wrap things up by sharing some recommendations around technology adoption and sustainability. Next slide. I'm a funder, so my goals are to foster innovative, significant work, scale and spread innovative, significant work that shows promise, and ultimately aim for sustainability. My purpose today is to share my thinking about how to achieve these goals from the perspective of provider to provider telehealth and hopefully invite a conversation about what you think. Next slide. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, or ARC, we're an agency within the Department of Health and Human Services, and our mission is depicted on this slide. As our former ARC director used to put it, while the NIH has a key focus on cures, ARC's focus is on care. Next slide. Regarding the division I represent, we were formerly known as the Health IT Division, and our new name reflects the fact that the digital healthcare ecosystem has recently exploded beyond the traditional health IT, such as electronic health records, and we wanted to capture that expansion. The graphic on the left of this slide denotes many of the elements of that expanded digital healthcare ecosystem. And our mission is to determine how the parts of that ecosystem can best come together to positively affect the quality and safety of healthcare. I also wanna mention our vision, which is that every patient and care team will have ready access to all applicable data and knowledge mediated by advanced analytics to address a patient's health and healthcare we're after ultimate data and knowledge liquidity at the point of care. It's important that I mention this because we believe that data, advanced analytics, and computable knowledge are foundational and will power high value future care modalities such as telehealth, which is our focus today. I also provided a link here to our website and recent annual report if you'd like more info about our work overall. Next slide. So, Many thinkers believe acceptance is the prelude to adoption of technology. Today, I'll be advocating for a systems approach to adoption that includes acceptance principles. The technology acceptance model has been a dominant model in the literature, and it posits a mediating role for perceived usefulness and ease of use in actual system acceptance. Perceived usefulness and ease of use, however, can also be affected by various external variables. So what does that mean? What do we mean? What do we need to look at when we're considering external variables that may, might play a role in technology acceptance and subsequent adoption? Next slide. We need to look at the context for the intervention. Context matters. We need to consider both the social and technical systems at play in P2P interventions or any technology intervention. Next slide. So this is what I mean by taking a systems approach to technology interventions. Not considering the systems that the technology intervention will be a part of is like playing whack-a-mole in my experience. Problems will keep surfacing during implementation and it will feel like you put out one fire only to have another start. Healthcare is a complex socio-technical system and you need to consider items like workflow, time pressures, and the cognitive needs of the healthcare team. Not considering the system the technology will be a part of and will be embedded in can comp compromise safety and effectiveness. Next slide. There are some socio-technical frameworks that will help you determine the factors that you need to consider when you take a systems approach to technology adoption. One such framework was developed by ARC grantee Pascal Carrion at the University of Wisconsin, and it's known as SEEPS, which stands for Systems Engineering Initiative for Patient Safety. The idea is to consider those elements in the external environment that are relevant to supporting care processes that result in desired outcomes. As noted in this slide, those elements can be organizational in nature, like organizational policies or organizational culture, which our keynote speaker mentioned today. They can be physical, like the physical constraints affecting the intervention, and they can be task technology or people related to. Next slide. So as I was thinking about this presentation, I serendipitously saw a piece in the Washington Post by Richard Thaler, the Nobel Prize winner and co-author of the book Nudge. In that piece, Thaler noted just what you see on this slide. If you want to encourage people to do something, make it easy. And sludge, 
which is any unnecessary friction is the opposite of helpful. So this seemed to very much relate to what I was trying to convey about technology adoption. Next slide. So as an advocate of the KISS principle, I took Taylor's, Thaler's sentiments, combined them with the ideas on the earlier slides I just shared with you, and created this slide, which I'm calling Technology Adoption Simplified. If you want a technology intervention to be adopted, make it useful, make it easy to use, and remove sludge, which you might think of as anything that gums up the work, so to speak. I hope this is simple to remember, but what does this look like from my funder's perspective? Next slide. When we're trying to make sure an intervention is useful, we typically ask these questions. Was there a clear need for the intervention? Does the intervention work? What were the patient outcomes, the organizational outcomes, the healthcare professional outcomes? And at ARC, answering these questions might begin with an R21 grant, which is for exploratory or developmental research. An R21 might progress to an R01 grant, which is longer and typically uses a randomized control trial to answer these questions. An R18, which is a research demonstration and dissemination project grant, might also be used to scale and spread a promising intervention. Next slide. Answering the questions on this slide about ease of use might occur during research supported by any of the previously mentioned grant mechanisms or an hour of three, which is a small grant mechanism. One of the use cases I'll describe shortly was funded by an R03. Next slide. Sludge removal might also occur during research supported by the previously mentioned mechanisms. If you're engaged in a pilot, however, and you've removed any source of friction from the pilot site effort, that doesn't necessarily guarantee that you won't encounter sludge when you test at more sites. Because remember, I mentioned earlier that context is key and the context will likely differ from site to site, and you need to plan for that. Using socio-technical frameworks like SEEPS to guide your research will help. As a funder, that's something I look for, is the grantee using a framework to guide the research around a technology intervention. It's worth mentioning that the systematic review my ARC colleagues oversaw that we're discussing here during this workshop categorized barriers and facilitators to implementation also using a framework the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research, or CIFR. So, on to the use cases. Next slide. This R01 study that I'll start with is comparing asynchronous telepsychiatry, or ATP, versus synchronous telepsychiatry, or STP, in the skilled nursing facility population in a randomized control trial with 250 skilled nursing facility residents from five skilled nursing facilities. There's a critical shortage of psychiatric services for people with mental illness who live in skilled nursing facilities, especially those living in rural settings. As depicted in this slide, the asynchronous telepsychiatry method utilizes a trained clinician to conduct videotaped interviews that are later reviewed by the consulting psychiatrist. Next slide. This slide offers a comparison between STP and ATP. In contrast to ATP, STP is live, simultaneous, and interactive video conferencing between patient and psychiatrist. It's a well-known method of providing medical care with over 30 years of use, whereas ATP is a relatively new method. While ATP has been shown to be more cost-effective than synchronous telepsychiatry in primary care settings, it's not utilized in skilled nursing facilities, and this study may shed light on whether it's feasible to use ATP in these settings. Next slide. The researchers conducting this R01 initially completed a pilot study demonstrating the acceptability and feasibility and impact of both forms of telepsychiatry in the skilled nursing facility setting. The pilot results provided preliminary data to support the ARC-funded RCT, which is currently ongoing. The investigators are testing the hypothesis that ATP is as effective as STP for skilled nursing facility residents by assessing patient-centered outcomes and satisfaction measurements and that it's more cost effective and will lead to reduced waiting times compared to STP. Next slide. On this slide, I put some of the initial findings into the task model so you can see how it plays out. From a usefulness perspective, the need has been established. 
patient outcomes were satisfactory in the pilot and the R01 will provide additional evidence regarding patient outcomes, wait times, and cost effectiveness. From an ease of use perspective, ATP is easier than SDP. There's no need to coordinate times on both ends and ATP doesn't need Wi-Fi immediately as STP does. And as you all know, Wi-Fi may be an issue in rural settings. But we don't have data as yet on SNF clinician perception. From a sludge removal perspective, the PI has indicated that staff turnover is the main workflow issue, but it's an issue for both STP and ATP in skilled nursing facilities. Pending further R01 results, if this research team wanted to scale and spread this intervention, I'd recommend some mixed methods work to look for other socio-technical issues that may be important factors for adoption. Next slide. For this next use case, I'm sure most of you know that treating stroke victims appropriately within three hours of stroke symptom onset greatly reduces physical and mental disabilities resulting from stroke. So emergency medical services in Georgetown County, South Carolina, with their partners at the Medical University of South Carolina Center for Telehealth, worked to successfully implement a pilot stroke telemedicine system in two ambulances. The system allows 24-hour access to MUSC stroke care experts, giving an ability to provide a stroke neurology consult in as little as nine minutes while driving to the ED. Next slide. Prior to expansion beyond the pilot, the researchers involved identified a critical need to evaluate the use of the system in these stressful, physically constrained environments. Their recently completed ARC-funded R03 study focused on developing and refining guidelines and recommendations for large-scale implementation of telemedicine systems for stroke care in ambulances. Such environments place high cognitive, physical, and temporal demands on caregivers that may lead to potential errors. A specific aim of this research was to evaluate the demands placed on the caregivers, the usability of the telemedicine system itself, and the barriers in the workflow associated in a telemedicine integrated ambulance-based setting for stroke care. This team actually used the SEEPS framework I mentioned earlier in conducting their work. Next slide. With respect to findings in specific task areas, the original pilot work established the usefulness of this type of intervention. Usability issues uncovered in this subsequent R03 study included system interface issues, like the lack of succinct error messages in the system to help the EMTs guide their data input better. And the research team noted that sludge removal needed to include improvements to the equipment and placement of the equipment on the ambulance, as well as greater consistency in EMT procedure steps. If anyone is interested in more detail around this work, I've provided the information for this team's recently published paper at the bottom of this slide. I really, I have to say, I really love what this group did. After a successful pilot, they specifically wanted to look for socio-technical issues that would affect broader adoption. It's worth mentioning that PI is a systems engineer, so he has this systems approach to, to these kinds of um, interventions. Let's move on to the last use case. Next slide. So it's no secret that nursing homes were badly affected by the pandemic. So using money from the Provider Relief Fund, which was authorized under the CARES Act, ARC set up the ARC ECHO National Nursing Home COVID-19 Action Network, which provided free training and mentorship to nursing homes across the country to increase the implementation of evidence-based infection prevention and safety practices to protect residents and staff more than 9,000 nursing homes nationwide voluntarily participated. The network's goals are noted on this slide. Next slide, please. This network uses the ECHO model of adult learning and practice improvement. Project ECHO, which as some have already mentioned, stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes, was established to provide training and telementoring for healthcare professionals and staff across the nation and around the world. As a side note, ARC funded the initial establishment and evaluation of Project ECHO, which began in 2004. The new network's training program used the evidence-based process pioneered by Project ECHO and referred to as the ECHO model, which is an interactive case-based approach founded on adult learning principles. For this particular instantiation of the model, there were over 320 cohorts of similar nursing homes 
trained by 99 training centers. Over 7,000 weekly training sessions facilitated by small multidisciplinary teams of subject matter and quality improvement experts and a combination of short didactic lectures that provided immediately usable best practices with case-based group learning. Customized training sessions for the express nursing home needs and it also provided a robust community of practice between sessions that fostered peer-to-peer -peer learning supported by expert consultation through quality coaches. Next slide. My ARC colleagues who worked on this effort are now looking at preliminary findings that are being compiled from the effort. Regarding usefulness of this intervention, nursing homes implemented changes to COVID-19 practice in real time and they're still continuing to adapt processes in other quality areas. Nursing homes report being taught how to use quality improvement techniques in real time, not just as an add-on to their busy day already. Case studies were most useful in changing practice and staff reported feeling less alone while being part of this network. Regarding ease of use, relationships and developing a trusting, safe environment were key to ease of use. Customization was easily implemented for smaller cohorts. Greater nursing home engagement tested to the ease of use of this model. Sludge issues included technology and connectivity issues that prevented face-to-face -face interaction for some nursing homes. It was learned that cohort size mattered. Larger cohorts were limited in their ability to customize curriculum. Next slide. So in summary, my recommendations for ensuring adoption of such interventions are to make them useful, easy to use, and to remove any sludge or friction. Using socio-technical frameworks can help you do that. But as a caution, doing all of that is not sufficient for sustaining the intervention. That's likely because of cost barriers. Paying for the three types of interventions I discussed with you today, once the grant funding runs out, is a huge concern of mine. So funders might consider requiring cost benefit analyses for interventions and or development of public private partnerships to help sustain and spread the intervention beyond the original sites. Now, some technology, some universities have tech transfer programs to help in this regard, but I'd be interested in hearing from others attending this session what your thoughts are about sustainability. Sustaining promising interventions like the ones I've mentioned is really the holy grail and I'd really like to hear if anyone out there has some ideas about how to best do that. Thank you. And my contact information is on the next slide. Thanks so much. Thank, and you. Th Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. That was a, a great presentation. Thank you for being so thorough. Um, okay, so we will now invite all of our key question one presenters to join the discussion in the Q&A session moderated by Dr. Wakefield. Uh, just a quick reminder to put send questions through the Q&A pod. Um, and we'll continue to receive your questions throughout the session where we are monitoring them. Mary, go right ahead. Thanks so much, Kate. And thanks to all three presenters, really interesting information. Um, I'm going to turn to invite uh, questions or comments first from two of the panelists and then the entire panel, but our first two panelists um, that we'll give the, the floor to, that I'll give the floor to would be uh, Robert and Becky. So just teeing it up for you. A reminder to everyone that we're on the first key question that focuses on the uptake of different types of P2P uh, uh, telehealth uh, in rural areas. And um, I'm also mindful of the comments made uh, by our EPC representative that of the four questions, the four key questions, this was the one that when they did the evidence review came in with the least, uh, um, the smallest body of evidence, if you will, uh, to address it. So. Um, all interesting, interesting presentations across the board, and then also a recognition uh, um, of the, the that smaller body of evidence, if I caught that correctly at the very beginning of the presentations. With that, let me turn to uh, Becky and to Robert and see if you, either of you have questions, and then I'm going to go ahead and move to the rest of the panel and then uh, open this up to uh, all of our participants. And thanks again to the three of you. So, uh, Becky or Robert? Okay, um, I'll I'll go first. So, um, Chris, my question is for you. Has ARC funded um, any work that tries to 
define what P2P telehealth is? So thank you for that question, Becky, and it's nice to see you again. I don't know if you remember, but many years ago when I was at the office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, we connected on some items. Anyway, um, the answer is no, sad to say, um, but you know, we'd love to do something um, in that vein at some point. And, and then my second question, and it may have been answered by the first, because I don't know how you do the second without definitions, but have you um, done any broader work that, that tries to capture the uptake, or is there anything in process that you might not have reported out because it's not finished yet? No, nothing, nothing that I can share at this point in time. However, you know, in, in general, uh, with the portfolio that, that I manage, we're, we're very concerned about uptake of technology interventions, right? It's, it, it's sort of like, as I mentioned, it's the, the holy grail, like, like, how can we ensure that these things get, you know, adopted by multiple sites, scaled and spread, and then are sustained? So we're we're actually actively searching for, for ways to do that. So stay tuned. We may come up with something soon. Okay, great. Yeah, because I really I liked your task. Task, I guess. <laughs> yeah, should should I um um you know somehow uh trademark that or <laughs> that that's my questions, Mary. Okay, thank you. Uh, Robert, do you have any questions or comments before we turn before I turn to the rest of the panel uh, to invite their comments or questions? No, I, I don't. I would just uh, have to agree that the, the task model was kind of interesting because I think it does kind of look at some of the uh, facts that each rural location is unique in its own uh, with all the challenges around workflow and the environment. And um, I, I think that's really helpful to kind of consider uh, as you move forward and looking at it, but I, I realize that, yeah, our, our key question number 1 is a little bit challenging to identify uh, what the uptake is. Thank you uh, for the rest of the panelists. Any questions or comments from you? From my colleagues. I have a question. Uh, thank you. I'm Sarah McClafferty and thank you for the great presentations. Um, I'm just wondering what sort of data do we need to uh, determine uptake of P2P? So just curious if you have any thoughts about kind of data needs. Um, you know, we have enormous amounts of data, but my impression is that it's not the right data. Thanks. Comment from any of the three uh, uh, panelists in response to that question? That's a really good question. Uh, it would be nice to know how many P2P consults there were. It would be nice to know how much was paid for it. It would be nice to know the satisfaction with it, and it would be nice to know patient outcomes. But because of our healthcare system, we're probably not going to know any of those things. Unfortunately, um, this is Annette. As earlier presenters have pointed out, you know there are some potential ways to get better data. One is, you know, if the e-consult codes that were used exist were actually used then Atif said he can find some things in claims data, but we know it's probably not very reliable or accurate. And so, you know, so, but then the question is, as the other presenter brought up, why aren't people using them? And can we get more sort of claims based? Because that's how we're documenting the clinician patient interactions happening by telehealth um, because they do get billed for. And when push comes to shove, when things get billed for, you have data. <laughs> that that's one of the key things for those consults. The other issues are a little trickier, like echo. I mean, there is some effort made to document echo programs nationally, but some of the other uses I, that wouldn't be tied to billing in the same way are, are a little more problematic. Although there's been some discussion, I believe that the actual case discussions could serve as a formal consult and could be billed under some systems. 
Thanks. Other questions from panelists? This is uh, Jay Sri Shankarnarayanan. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Jay Sri. Uh, Thanks. Yeah, my question is for Dr. Viti. Uh, great presentation, very interesting uh, about the islands and how you know telehealth is needed uh, and how you all are providing it. So my question is, uh, I was wondering if the pharmacist as a provider has uh, had any role and. Is that something, you know, on the horizon, are you all considering it or what's the status of the pharmacist as a provider? That's an excellent question. Uh, we have a large number of pharmacists here in Hawaii, but we don't have much billing capacity for them. Um, okay. So they are very involved in the echoes, uh, especially the geriatric echo and mm -hmm. the um, now the um, medication for opioid use disorder echo. And I'm hoping that that means that they are available to provide services in those areas. And so that may come of it because we are looking at models for them to provide some uh, healthcare services um, that is under review, but it, it doesn't actually exist yet. Yes, because yes. in the US uh, pharmacists are providing medication therapy management services and they are able to bill for it. So that's why, and then uh, there is a telepharmacy model wherein you know, the medical center is contracting with the rural hospitals and providing pharmacy services. So I was very curious to know, uh, you know, uh, what is the evidence and what is the status? So this is very helpful to understand where. And actually that would be helpful to the Pacific because they have very few, in fact, it might just be one or two PharmDs. They have a lot of farm techs. Um, but they're okay. very small countries, so they don't have farm D's. So it might be a really helpful model to look at that, but I fear it would have to be grant funded because they don't have yes. much money. <laughs> I know University of Hawaii has a farm D program, isn't it? Mm -hmm. so. Yes, we do. It's about eight years old, I think, and it's actually saturated our market. So okay. it's done quite well. Um, that's why I say they're looking for other roles to play. But the Pacific, yeah, they don't, the small countries, developing countries don't have it yet, but maybe we'll write a grant together to look at that. Oh, that'd that? be great. <laughs> Thanks for that uh, information. Are there and, other things? Uh, oh, go ahead. Yes, my you. next question is for mm -hmm. Annette. Uh, I know you might have probably answered this. Uh, in your review, when you talk about provider to provider, uh, is it uh, only physicians or is no. it is it provider? We, we included it, any perf healthcare professional, so nurses, pharmacists, physicians, PAs, um, as long as it was a healthcare service and a healthcare professional. I said the only thing we excluded were informal caregivers, family caregivers. Okay, and it could be asynchronous. Yes. Meaning uh, it yes. need not be a two way street. It could be just well, the. It, it still has to be two way, but two -way it doesn't have communication. to be at the same time. It could be asynchronous, mm -hmm. but if okay. but if there had to be an interaction, right? So it can be asynchronous in that someone requests a consult and someone provides the data back. Okay. It was would not include just a referral. So if you okay. just referred a patient and that was the only nothing came back to you then that it wasn't considered because enough. because in some telehealth models the uh, the provider would leave uh, notes in the electronic medical records for the provider in the rural that setting would be considered because you know, that's the e consult model and yes. so there's interaction right the one provider requests the consult and the other provider provides the consult that's different than just saying I would like to send Mr. Smith for a cardiologist. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. Thanks, Anand. Sure. Are there other questions from panelists? Then let me share one from the audience uh, and see if one of you might perhaps be able to respond to this. The question is, would the claims information from commercial insurance also use P2P consultation codes? 
or is data most likely to be CMS centric only? If CMS only, how do we have data across populations, whether they're publicly or privately funded? Yeah. So I don't know if Atif is still on because he might be the best person or some, maybe also connected care. Um, you know, a lot of private insurance does follow Medicare when it comes to coding. So, um, and if you want things paid for, there's still codes in the private sector too. Um, where it's a little more challenging actually is in unified systems like the VA or Kaiser, where, you know, there isn't, but there's still sort of monitoring of resource use. Um, but the VA is an interesting model where it doesn't necessarily um, affect payment, but it affects how they can distribute their workforce. Thanks, Annette. Um, any other questions from the panel? Uh, because that's the only question in the Q and A uh, that I have. So just last last call for questions for this panel. And if not, I'm going to turn it back over to Kate. Any other last questions or comments? Um, I notice. Oh, there was a start of a question in the comments, but it. I'm not sure the person finished it yet, so I don't know if I can answer it. <laughs> if you're seeing it, Annette, and I'm not, feel free to go right ahead and put it out there. Um, because I'm not seeing it, so go ahead. Yeah. Well, someone was asking, it was, um, I think, reiterating the point that it was stated that a lot of the projects are funded by pilot grant funds, and that is true, and that's definitely one of the issues and that um, that comes in with sustainability is that once the pilot funds are gone, um, how do you keep the programs going? And that comes up in some of what we'll see tomorrow in the um, implementation question. And that's a common problem that we found in the literature. Can I just ask in response to that, is the billing code for P2P consultation actually reimbursed is it paid yes how much is it paid and well that was in a prior presentation and it's not my area of expertise and i don't think he's still uh, um are either of those panelists on mary i don't know if i didn't see it I, I don't i don't know but the um but some of that information is provided in the uh on one of the slides that was used uh, that lists the codes and so um, the, those slides, I believe, will be available and you would be more than welcome uh, to, to uh, pull them down. If you don't have access to them for some reason, I'm sure um, the, our, the uh, NIH staff could get could make the connection for you. Yeah, it was listed yeah. in terms of resource utilization units, I think, is and that ranged from anywhere from like 15 to $75. So it's not a huge amount, depending on which code was used. Yeah, because if doctors don't think it's going to be worth their time to put it down, they're not going to put it down. So we have to right. make it worth their time to actually add it to the billing slip. Um, I think the last question and is, is this uh, that I'm seeing in the um, Q and A, and this is for any any one of the three panelists. What what is happening at the national level to make telemedicine more easily adopted? That's a really big question, a general question. Um, uh, if there's a um, a way to link that to the key question we're focused on, that would be ideal. That is the uptake of different types of P2P telehealth in rural areas. What is the the uptake? Uh, but would anyone like to take a um, uh, a bite at that particular question? That is what's happening at the national level to make telemedicine more easily adopted. Any of the three of you? Well, I'll take a shot from my research perspective, which is, you know, I mentioned in my presentation that we're looking for research that actually uses socio-technical frameworks to, to do this kind of uh, intervention work. And we think that will lead to adoption ultimately, because we'll establish the efficacy of the intervention uh, along various dimensions as well as uh, remove any socio-technical issues that would be present to adoption and making the intervention more easily adopted. So, so that's one thing, it's a small thing that we're doing, but I think it's a very important thing. Yeah, thanks for that, for uh, adding in that observation. Uh, any other uh, observations in response to this question? 
Sure. So on the policy level with a, you know, a capital P, what's going on right now is I think everybody knows is debates about what the various rules and regulations that were um, enacted during the pandemic, which will stay and which will go. And they're not just about reimbursement. A licensure is a big issue when you get into telehealth and in terms of, you know, what you can do across state lines. So there are several sort of policy issues hurdles that we overcame for the pandemic and the question is will those rules persist or not is going to be a big issue and then i actually think when we get to some more things that one of the things that might be happening but i'm not sure it really is maybe it's just wishful thinking is that some of this probably needs to happen on a regional level that nationals too big but locals too small to make it sustainable and that the needs and differences might be best addressed on some sort of a regional level. Well, that's an interesting thought, Annette. Thanks for leaving us with something else to think about. And um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and close then and hand it back over to Kate for the end of a, a long but unbelievably rich uh, day <laughs> and that we'll all be coming back for uh, more great content uh, tomorrow. So thanks again to each of the three of you um, on behalf of the panel. Kate, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wakefield, for moderating and to our key question one speakers. It has been a long day, but I think it's gone really well. So thank you, everyone. Um, just a couple of quick notes um, before we end. I'd like to cover what to expect tomorrow. So if you've already registered for day two, you should have received a reminder, including the link. It's a different link than today, so make sure to look for that. Um, and we ask that you please join us by about 10.55. We'll cover key questions two and three tomorrow. And if you haven't registered yet, you can do so at prevention.nih.gov. Um, and then lastly, as Annette said a minute ago, please review the systematic evidence review if you would like. It's open for public comment. And the link can be found at uh, prevention.nih.gov. And we really welcome everybody's inputs uh, from the attendees and also the speakers um, on our workshop today. And that's it. Thank you for an excellent day. We'll see you tomorrow at 1055 Eastern time and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.